Good morning, everyone. My name is Joaquin Escobar. I'm chair of the State Water Board. Today is Tuesday, December 3rd, and it is 9.31, and I would like to call today's meeting to order. I'll begin by introducing my fellow board members. To my left is board member Sean McGuire. To my right is board member Tam Doduck. And assisting us today on staff are Michael Lawfer, our chief counsel, Eileen Sobeck, executive director, Jonathan Bishop, our chief deputy director, and Eric, and Eric Oppenheimer, chief deputy director. Today assisting the board is uh, Janine Townsend, the clerk, and uh, her assistant, Courtney Tyler. Now I'll quickly go through our emergency evacuation procedure. Please look around and identify the two exits closest to you. In the event of a fire alarm, we are required to gather up our valuables and evacuate this room immediately. We're to evacuate to Cedar Chavez Park, which is across the street. Please obey all traffic signals and be careful when crossing the street. I also want to let you know that this meeting is being webcast and recorded, so speak into the microphone when you come up. And last, but more importantly, please turn off all your noise-making devices. We'll begin today by, uh, with the presentation of a Sustained Superior Accomplishment Awards, and we'd like to call up uh, Eric Ekdahl to, uh, or Diane Riddle, to, uh, to present the first award. Hello, all right, I think that's working. Hi, I'm very happy to be here today on behalf of Eric Ekdahl along with Connie Mitterhofer to present Michael Buckman with the Sustained Superior Accomplishment Award for his many years of hard work and dedication in the Division of Water Rights. Uh, Michael has been with the division for the past seven and a half years. During that time, he has worked on some of the division's most complex and controversial projects and as well as pitching in on projects that were not directly within his unit's responsibilities when other supervisors departed and, and he fit in well and always made sure that things continued to run smoothly. He always makes sure that the board meetings are, the, the board hearings are running smoothly, workshops are running smoothly, we're prepared for board briefings, puts in many extra hours and always makes sure that work products are completed well and on in, in a, and as on time as we can possibly get them, giving all of the constraints. So with that, I'll um, have Connie Mitterhofer join me to say a few more words about Michael's um, work history. Good morning, Chair Eskimal and members of the board. Um, for those of you who don't know Michael, uh, Michael's a senior environmental scientist overseeing the hearings unit in the Division of Water Rights. Um, his unit is responsible for planning and conducting hearings on complex water use and water right matters and for writing orders and decisions that uh, to resolve legally and factually disputed issues. He and his staff work closely with one or more of the board members filling the role of hearing officers on high visibility and high priority projects. Michael provides mentorship and guidance to his staff in analyzing evidence in the hearing record and conducting technical evaluations necessary for board orders and decisions. Uh, his unit's work products are well organized and of high quality um, and are testimony not only to Michael's um, extensive program knowledge, but also to his hard work, dedication, and commitment to the division's goals. Michael works hard to provide a balanced workload for his staff and is always willing to pitch in extra effort and time to ensure that deadlines are being met. I'm extremely happy to be here and join the board and the division in providing this um, Sustained Superior Accomplishment Award to Michael. Connie, may I add a few words as well? As one of the two hearing officers, and I'm, I'm very confident I can speak on behalf of former chair, uh, Marcus as well, for what has been one of the most complicated hearings that I've ever been involved with, the water fix hearing, I will add my thanks to those already expressed, to Michael and the entire team, but Michael uh, specifically right now, for just your outstanding work in that process. It was over two years long. There was a lot of details, a lot of parties, a lot of moving pieces, and you handled all of it with great professionalism, great technical expertise, but most appreciative of all, always a good sense of humor and a great attitude. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much. Next, I'd like to call up uh, Darren Polhamus to administer our second award. Thank you. I have a, a group award as well uh, to do today. You can see the stack here. Uh, so I'm going to bring a whole team up. If uh, my crew could start walking while I read your names, you know who you are. Uh, this is the GIS work group for the Division of Drinking Water. Uh, today we're presenting to Misha Anderson, Wes Steringer, uh, Jason Carter, Hector Caveras, Katie Conaton, Eli McFarlane, Ray Vanderwerf, and Janice Oakley. So this is a story of a good idea often means a lot of work. Uh, so obviously uh, collecting location data in our database was a great idea until this crew and some of their predecessors thought that uh, we should see how good the data actually is in the database, which of course it was horrible and couldn't be used. Over 9,000 uh, points of uh, actual locations had to be corrected. At that point, I would have quit. Right, but they didn't. They buckled down. They got to business, and uh, basically corrected all of those records. Uh, we have more to go uh, to keep making improvements and adding more features to that. But uh, I think that work is tremendous. It it's then allowed those data points to be used effectively in numerous things. And I'm going to read off a few of them here. You may recognize. So uh, we've used them now through several horrible fire seasons to develop our emergency response maps. Uh, we're able to identify water systems that are in path of fires uh, and to great effect uh, use this with the emergency response folks and in our own work in order to help uh, get water systems back up and make sure they get the both the uh, aid they need and uh, recovery response. Um, then, of course, as you know, we've been working on a lead and copper survey and being able to display that in a map format to allow the public to quickly get access to it rather than scanning tables, I think is a, a huge public service and a great communication tool associated with that. Uh, after we adopted the 123 TCP MCL, as you recall, then there was a, a need to put that information out so that the public could digest it in a much more uh, better fashion and actually so that I could digest it you know, knowing locations of maps and where those are at and the uh, different contamination points is, is critical. And so it's one of those classic cases where without a GIS tool, you know, a list of wells is, is hard to process in your mind. Uh, and so this team was able to put that together. We've got, um, continuing on, we've got the PFAS monitoring data that we came up with. So we had UCMR3 data and we needed to know where to sample that when we were ordering further PFAS sampling uh, last early la early this year uh, and able to bring that about. And so that was essential in identifying those locations um, to pat match them up with the airports and the um, landfills and make sure that we were effective in where we ordered testing. And um, more recently, uh, we've been using it a bunch for the PSPS tools when we have power outages, knowing water systems that are going to be impacted, and turning that into a map quickly communicates versus the, the list. So I probably missed half of what this team's done. I know it's kind of like it becomes second nature and kind of uh, just percolates up and you get used to the map, but I think it's important to recognize that they took this on um, as a secondary role beyond what obviously their main tasks are and accomplish these things. And we look forward to all the things they're gonna accomplish in the future going forward. So I, I truly appreciate uh, all that work. Thank you so much for doing it.
road here? It takes a village. Thank you all so very much. The work is certainly, um, can seem basic, certainly on the data side, but it's so fundamental to so much of what we do here at the board. So thank you all for your continued contributions. Really appreciate being able to make sure we acknowledge staff and, and uh, have these opportunities to do so. Uh, next, we'll move on to public forum. Janine, no public comment cards. And so next we'll move on to our first item, which is uh, consideration of the minutes from November 19th. Uh, I'll now entertain a motion. I'll move for adoption of the minutes. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries and board meeting minutes are adopted. Next move on to uncontested items. Uh, I'll mention that included in uncontested items at this point are also items number five and six, unless Janine, at this point, have there been any comment cards? So those are also uncontested, but I think we'll go ahead and still keep items five and six for just a brief, just kind of overview of what, what's being proposed, because I think it's really great work that staff are doing there. Uh, but with that, uh, and I'll flag with uh, item number two, um, I'll like to see if anyone will make a motion, but I will be abstaining from voting on the item. So any? Move um, adoption of uncontested item number two. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Item carries and is adopted. Thank you all. With that, we'll move on to our informational items. Our first um, being, uh, Chair, would you like to publicly state your? Oh, my position? reason. On, no, no, just oh. just that you abstain. Oh, I, I did oh, before did the vote. Yeah, well, I think just prior to the vote. Should I say we'll, it again? We'll go ahead and make the sure vote? the minutes reflect that you abstain. Oh, okay, but in okay. the future, we'll just register that abstention during okay. the voting process. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Okay, even the clerk didn't realize that. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. And so with that, we'll move on to informational item number three, our current hydrologic conditions. I'm sorry, number three is not. Did we move three and four as well? Three, number three. Sorry, we move three? We're, we're on information. Okay. Sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one. That's okay. <laughs> ah, got it. Good morning, Mr. Demchuk. Good morning. My name is Vadim Demchuk, engineer with the Division of Water Rights. And with me today is Michael Macon. And we're here to present item number three, the hydrology update for the Bay Delta watershed. So we definitely have some good news. After a dry start, we had back-to-back -back storms that gave us a considerable amount of um, uh, rain and snow. So that's good news. Um, Yeah, if you can, thank you. Um, here's a look at precipitation. The Northern Sierras is at 50% of average for this date, sitting at 5.3, 5.1 inches at the lower left-hand corner there in the blue line. Uh, next, please. Um, for Central Sierras, we're at 4.9 inches at 68% of average for this date. Good news, next, please. Southern Sierras is at 75% of average and 3.4 inches for this date. Here's a look at our reservoirs overall. We're uh, relatively full for today, and um, which is which is great, just because it provides a buffer for dry years. And of course, it's too early to tell what type of water year we will be having, um, but uh, storage conditions are looking good as well. Kachuma Reservoir is at 72% of capacity and 95% of average. Diamond Valley Lake at 93% of capacity and San Luis Reservoir, 43% of capacity and 72% of average. We're looking at the drought monitor as of November 26th. Um, almost um, the entire state is at abnormally dry conditions. And of course, this was issued before the storm, so it'll be interesting to see how this map changes uh, with, 
I think it will be changing anytime soon now. So. Certainly indicates how really dry we, those first two two months were. Even on the graph, you saw just how flat line we were so early in the water year here. So the rain is, is well welcome for sure. October, November, I think were the driest on record so far. So the the, the storms were definitely welcomed here. Um, Colorado Basin, the drought. Uh, Situation looks similar from the last month's update. The only thing different is that little extreme drought blob there on the border of um, Utah and Arizona. Yeah, here's the official outlook coming from the NOAA Climate Prediction Center. Um, the 8 to 14 day outlook is showing a probability of above average temperatures shown in the orange colors. And looking at precipitation as of December 2nd, the short term outlook is showing higher probability of above average precipitation for Northern California and higher probability of below average precipitation for Southern California. And with that, uh, that's our portion of the brief. We were available for any questions. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Next informational item is an update on urban water conservation. Just let Miss, yeah. Just let Miss Tyler know, and we'll click through the slide for you. The button's not working. Good morning. Good morning. Um, hello. Uh, my name is Marielle Panjero, and I am a research data specialist with the Office of Research Planning and Performance. I will be presenting the Urban Water Conservation Report for October of 2019. Um, this item summarizes key results for uh, water production in 2019, which is the 65th month since the Water Board began tracking um, monthly data for each of the state's largest urban water suppliers, more than 3,000 connections. Um, thank you to the last presenters for uh, providing some context. Um, so. A reminder that even though we have had some rain over the past um, couple of days, October was extremely dry. Um, most of the southern half of the state exactly, um, specifically was at 0% of historical average or 1% of historical average. Um, if there was any rain at all, it was mostly contained to the northern half of the state. So um, that's uh, what we will be seeing in the numbers. Next slide. This graph shows um, water production for 2019, um, which is the orange line. The dashed orange line um, tracks is, is the estimated production since we don't have full reporting. It tracks pretty well with 2017 as we've seen in um, some of the past couple months. So it gives us a pretty good baseline of non-drought usage in California. Next slide. In terms of average residential use for October, we saw an estimated 98 gallons per person, um, which seems to hold steady again with um, trends that we have seen for the past couple of years for October. Um, considering that October was so dry, this is very good news. So even when we have less precipitation, we're still seeing um, residential usage holding steady. Next slide. Um, we do continue to see uh, less than full percentage of reporting. Um, for this month, 322 suppliers, 79% uh, of the total reported for 2000, October 2019. Next slide. In terms of next steps, the uh, timeline for reporting regulation adoption, there's a typo on this slide. The comment period will run through December 30th. And if the schedule 
holds, then this results in an effective date for uh, implementing the regulation um, by April 1st of 2020. We plan to work with our stakeholders, stakeholders on refining and beta testing in your court form. Um, information about the rulemaking can be found at the uh, link that is listed there um, in the what's new section. And we will, the, the next item on that list pertains to water loss rulemaking. We are working to convene stakeholder calls, which are a follow-up to a September workshop um, and the subsequent comments we received in October. Um, and then finally, now that the uh, rain has started, we are going to be uh, seeing how the, uh, the wet season compares to the uh, previous years. Thank you, any questions? No, I think we're great. Thank you so much. Really appreciate the, the good work. I think uh, I'm certainly interested in making sure um, we continue to, to move toward mandatory reporting, knowing that you know that estimate is nice, but getting back to what our actual numbers is going to be is really good. Thank you so much for your work. Next, we move on to uh, items number five and six, with a presentation from the Division of Financial Assistance on a proposed resolution to amend the policy for implementing the Clean Water and Drinking Water State Revolving Funds. Good morning, Chair Esquivel and uh, board members. Uh, my name is Joshua Fegger. I'm an engineer with the Division of Financial Assistance. To my right is Mr. Robert Pontrieri, Senior Water Resource Control Engineer. And to my left is Ms. Wen Chun Lei with the uh, sanitary, Senior Sanitary Engineer. And to her left is uh, Mr. Zach Miller with the Office of Chief Counsel. So um, we're here today to present on items five and six, which are the proposed amendments to the implementation uh, policies for implementing the Clean Water State Revolving Fund and the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund. So in this presentation, we'll go over the purpose of the amendment, uh, the effect of the proposed changes, and the implementation schedule. The Clean Water and Drinking Water State Revolving Fund provides low interest financing uh, for communities throughout the state of California. Um, in order to continue to provide this uh, service, we've proposed uh, amendments to both policies that will help reduce the workload on contract staff by eliminating the mandatory agreement amendment process. Um, it, the proposed amendment would also allow recipients to draw construction funds sooner. It also clarify the requirements in the project agreement and disbursement process sections. So these sections will be aligned in both the clean water and drinking water policy language. So the changes, uh, again, will apply to both the clean water and, stay, uh, and drinking water stay revolving funds. Uh, by eliminating, or in order to eliminate the uh, amendment process, the mandatory amendment process, we've decided or proposed that the construction budget be included in the initial funding agreement, um, which will be determined during the technical review process. Uh, so again, the final budget amendment will be eliminated, but we recognize that some amendments will still be needed and they can still be requested by the applicant for the division's approval. By including the construction costs into the initial agreement, it would allow the recipients uh, to request their funds sooner. This will be an overall positive change. It'll help accelerate uh, their process for getting construction funds. Uh, it'll also minimize the workload 
imposed on contract staff due to the required amendments that we currently need. Um, and it'll all allow us to focus on any new funding agreements for projects. So uh, to include the construction costs into the initial agreement um, uh, doesn't, or to include it in the initial agreement um, allows us to review the construction documents at the time that the applicant is ready to request their first disbursement for construction funds. And so that will help minimize uh, the time required uh, that they have to wait for an amendment currently. So um, implementation, so the current amendments for existing agreements will still be processed uh, to incorporate their final construction budget. Um, staff has identified existing templates and forms that will be affected if the board approves uh, the amendments today. Um, and we are ready to make any of those adjustments. Um, the division is proposing that uh, agreements not currently being routed uh, use the new approach and any existing agreements will continue to use the um, previous approach requiring the um, amendment of the process. So we received uh, three comment letters uh, from two commenters. Uh, the first uh, common letter was a joint letter from the Clean Water Action, Community Water Center, and Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability Organizations. Um, we'd like to uh, thank them for their comments, but uh, due to the narrow scope of what this amendment covers, their comments were more of a uh, broad over the entire policy. Um, so. Um, we'd like to invite them to continue to provide us comments and look forward to working with them to incorporate them in future amendments or um, and in other avenues like the IEP and other stakeholder meetings. Uh, the other, the last comment letter was received from Inland Empire Utilities Agency um, regarding the uh, removal of the ability to increase funding agreements. Um, the policies still include uh, the ability for an applicant to request an increase in their agreement uh, per the division's approval. So with that, uh, if there are any questions, we will be happy to answer those. No, I, I just really appreciate and wanted to provide the opportunity for folks to understand uh, the work that staff has done here and proposed, you know, the streamlining uh, both for our processes and but for the benefit of project implementation is you know, the sort of uh, work that I, I really uh, like to see. I, I continue to encourage and really like to ensure that we're uh, best uh, communicating to folks. Um, you know, the state revolving loan fund, uh, both on the drinking water and clean water side, you know, put out you know, billions, as you all well know as staff, uh, in infrastructure in the state of California over just say the last five years since drinking water has come over to the state board. Um, and it's a, it's a tool that we continue to want to innovate around, ensure that it's meeting the needs of projects and folks in the state of California, but that we also are improving processes. Um, and this is one that doesn't uh, diminish or, or hurt our ability to have the oversight that we need to ensure that you know, there isn't any waste, fraud, or abuse within, within the program. Uh, but at the same time, um, uh, it, it, it keeps those safeguards, but uh, it certainly uh, improves processing time on our part and for projects on the outside as well. So just thank, thank you staff for, for that great work and hearing no other questions, just uh, that would be all. So thanks. Thank you. Next we'll move on to item number seven, which oh, I- You're gonna have to oh, vote sorry. on it. Oh, no we won't, we still have to vote. <laughs> I, Apologies. I, just, I also wanted to thank you for all your work and you know, as a former employee of the Division of Financial Assistance, I certainly appreciate all the work that you do in moving that SRF programs forward. And um, also looking, you know, continuously looking for areas where we can improve efficiency and look for opportunities to streamline. And I understand from this change alone, you might see, I know every project's a little bit different, but you might see, you know, a few months shaved off of the agreement uh, process. And that's really remarkable. So I'm really excited to see, you know, how that helps addressing the backlog of projects that currently exist and, and just going forward, being able to move you know, these funds through to fund important projects more quickly and efficiently is, 
is what we should always be striving for. So thank you. And um, with that, I, I'll move to adopt items five and six. My thanks as well, and I will second the motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And uh, the motion carries this time and is actually adopted, and I can move on to item number seven. <laughs> thank you again to staff. Thank you. And before we go to item number seven, I actually have a statement uh, which I will read here. This is a public hearing and consideration of adoption of the proposed final staff report and work plan for the 2019 review of the water quality control plan for ocean waters of California. This item includes a public hearing and consideration of adoption uh, of the final staff report and work plan for 2019 for the ocean plan review. The state water board will consider adoption of the proposed final staff report and work plan after consideration of all comments. This hearing is being recorded. There will be no, there will not be sworn testimony. If you intend to speak during public comment for this item, please fill out a speaker card and give it to the clerk located in front of the room, which is Ms. Townsend here. When you come to the podium, please state your name slowly and identify the organization that you represent, if any. We will have a staff presentation by Catherine Walsh, followed by public comments. Ms. Walsh will now proceed with the staff presentation. Good morning, Chair Esquivel and members of the board. Um, again, my name is Catherine Walsh. I'm the Senior Environmental Scientist supervising the Ocean Standards Unit in the Division of Water Quality here at the State Water Board. Also with me this morning is Rebecca Fitzgerald, the Environmental Program Manager over the Water Quality Standards and Assessment section in the Division of Water Quality, and Marley Wood with the Office of Chief Counsel. So now I'll move forward with our presentation, but before I jump in on the 2019 Ocean Plan Review, I'm going to give a little bit of a background on the Ocean Plan and what we've been doing since the last review. So the Ocean Plan was first adopted in 1972 and was most recently amended uh, this year with the bacteria amendments which took effect on February 4th. The ocean plan sets forth the uh, beneficial uses for ocean waters of California. It establishes water quality objectives to protect those uses and sets forth a program of implementation describing the actions necessary to achieve those beneficial uses. The ocean plan was last reviewed in 2011, which resulted in the identification of 26 issues, of which six were identified as very high ranking issues and 10 were identified as high-ranking issues. Since 2011, the State Water Board has adopted amendments to the Ocean Plan that address seven of these very high and high-ranking issues that were identified in the 2011 Ocean Plan Review. So now I'd like to take a moment to uh, share what we've accomplished since 2011. In 2012, the State Water Board adopted the State Water Quality Protected Areas and Marine Protected Areas Amendment to the Ocean Plan, which took effect in July of 2013. Through this amendment, the State Water Board adopted new criteria for nominating and designating State Water Quality Protected Areas, as well as incorporating provisions for the protection of specific types of discharges near marine protected areas. Also in 2012, the State Water Board adopted the Mono Monitoring and Vessel Discharges Amendment. This amendment um, amended the Ocean Plan to include more effective and efficient means for monitoring the effects of discharges into ocean waters through model monitoring. And it also aligned provisions in the Ocean Plan with state and federal laws and regulations for commercial vessel discharges. This amendment also applied various uh, formatting and grammatical changes to the Ocean Plan. Then in 2015, the State Water Board adopted the Trash Amendments, which took effect on January of 2016. Um, through this amendment, the State Water Board adopted provisions to establish a narrative water quality objective for trash, a prohibition of discharge of trash into state waters, and a program of implementation which focuses limited resources on high trash generating areas. Also in 2015, the State Water Board adopted the desalination amendment, which also took effect on January of 2016. Through this amendment, the State Water Board adopted provisions addressing the impacts to marine life associated with the construction and operation of seawater desalination facilities. More recently, in 2018, the State Water Board adopted the Bacteria Objectives Amendment. 
Through this amendment, uh, the State Water Board addressed new bacteria water quality objectives and implementation provisions to protect recreational users from the effects of pathogens in ocean waters of California. And most recently in 2019, the State Water Board adopted the wetland definitions and procedures for discharge of dredge or fill materials, which will take effect on May 28th of 2020. So now I'll speak to the 2019 Ocean Plan Review. Reviews of water quality control plans are required by both the Clean Water Act and the California Water Code. This review itself is a non-regulatory planning exercise, and the purpose of the review is to identify, evaluate, and rank issues that may lead to rulemaking actions that modify existing or adopt new standards or provisions. This is to keep pace with regulatory and policy changes, new technologies, and environmental shifts with the goal of ensuring the continued adequacy of the ocean plan and protection of ocean water quality in California. The review provides an opportunity for public, stakeholders, and other interested parties to provide input on our planning priorities for the ocean plan. The 2019 Ocean Plan Review resulted in the uh, proposed final staff report and work plan, which contains a ranked list of issues which we are presenting for your consideration today. So we initiated the 2019 Ocean Plan Review in late 2018. Since we performed outreach both during the initial scoping phase of this review and during the public comment period, Staff used the input and comments received from uh, these uh, outreach opportunities to inform our staff report and work plan. And following today's hearing, if adopted, the 2019 Ocean Plan Review will be transmitted to the US EPA in Region 9. Through this review, we identified uh, 22 discrete issues. These issues covered a wide range of environmental issues. And these, are, um, these include issues from the 2011 review, which were retained or modified, as well as new issues identified since 2011. There are four very high-ranking issues and eight high-ranking issues, which will be the focus of our presentation. I'd like to note that the overall rank of each issue is not reflective of its level of importance. Rather, this ranking system was applied as a tool to provide insight as to where we could focus um, limited resources to have the most impact or significant benefit. In regards to resources, the State Water Board's staff resources available to work on issues identified in this work plan are primarily in the Division of Water Quality's Ocean Standards Unit, which currently has three full-time staff and one Sea Grant Fellowship posting, although there may be resources from other State Water Board and Regional Board units as well. In addition to the work on the ocean plan, the Ocean Standards Unit also works on existing projects such as implementing the once through cooling policy and managing the coastal beach water quality monitoring program. With resources in mind, staff developed uh, criteria to assess and rank issues comparatively to each other and staff considered the input and comments from stakeholders as well as available information and resources associated with each issue. For group one criteria, they were developed to evaluate each issue's um, potential value or impact for water quality or beneficial uses. We considered um, each issue against these criteria to evaluate its potential for improving the pre preservation, enhancement, and restoration of water quality and beneficial uses of ocean waters, the potential for an issue's um, to improve the program facilitation and customer service, as well as the benefit of approaching an issue from a statewide level to provide consistency or address a need in more than one region. As for the group two criteria, these were developed to consider the level of effort to address an issue. In evaluating each issue against these criteria, we considered the opportunities and resources available that could lead to successful completion of a regulatory amendment to the ocean plan. For example, which science and research is currently available to support a regulatory amendment and what resources are likely available to augment state water board resources. We also considered if an issue is already close to completion or if it was low, lower controversy or lower technical complexity 
um, as it could uh, be more completed, it could be completed more efficiently with fewer resources. Um, so we took a look at all of the issues and this is the result of our ranking system. Um, and since it's hard to read, I'm just gonna focus on the top 12 issues, which ranked in high or very high. So uh, again, the rank an issue receives is not reflective of its level of importance. The ranking system is comparative and allows us to uh, identify where to focus our limited resources more effective, effectively and efficiently. Those issues that are not addressed will be kept on record and considered during the preparation of the next review of the ocean plan. We anticipate preparing a proposed amendment to the ocean plan addressing one or more higher ranking issues over the course of the next few years. However, should uh, new information become available or should priorities change, there is nothing that would preclude us from picking up an issue that does not fall into the high or very high category or an issue that is not identified in this review. Um, so these are the top 12 issues that are very high or high ranking um, and are more likely to be staffed in the coming years. Um, we think that all of these issues would be valuable to take on and would further ensure the protection of ocean water quality and the beneficial uses of ocean waters in California. That said, um, there, even though we can likely only take on one or two of these issues depending on its complexity, uh, we will continue to engage on follow the science on other issues for which we do not have the capacity to prepare amendments to the ocean plan or for which more research is necessary to develop amendments. For example, the Ocean Standards Unit staff and other state water board staff are already engaged in conversations about or following research and scientific developments associated with uh, issues such as ocean acidification and hypoxia, discharge, discharge exceptions to areas of special biological significance, microplastics and microfibers, and bacteria objectives for water contact recreation. So during the public comment period, we received 20 comment letters. Most comments were supportive of issues identified um, and supportive of issue rankings. Issue O, the desalination provisions review, received the greatest number of comments. These comments were both in support and opposition of the recommendation in the staff report. Other issues that received many comments include issue N, the bacteria objectives for water contact recreation, Issue H, shellfish beneficial uses and objectives, and issue F, ocean acidification, hypoxia, and climate change impacts. Um, these comments were generally supportive and reflected that these would be valuable issues for us to address. We expect to hear additional comments at this hearing on the proposed final staff report and work plan. Our staff recommendation is the State Water Board adopt uh, the resolution before you, which includes the adoption of the staff report and work plan, and authorizes the executive director to transmit this review to the US EPA Region 9. Um, staff further recommend the State Water Board direct staff to evaluate one or more higher ranking issues and prepare recommendations for any necessary changes to the ocean plan. Staff also recommend the State Water Board affirm that the ocean plan remains effective and that any issues from previous reviews are either resolved, no longer relevant, or have been incorporated into the 2019 ocean plan review. This concludes my uh, presentation. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to take any comments or questions at this time and also as we continue throughout the hearing. If I may speak. Yes, Ms. Um, I want to address two proposed revisions that we have to the response to comments that we think better address the intent. Both of these are for issue O, the desalination provisions, and they address concerns that were raised by a number of commenters on the effect of any future ocean plan amendment to currently pending project applications. And what we have in there doesn't quite get us there, so I do have two minor revisions, which I can put a slide up if you'd like to see it, or, okay? Yeah, let's go ahead and put it up now. Thank you, Ms. Wall, okay. Ms. Wood. Almost had it. We almost had it. Almost I was, it. I thought she had it on her presentation. Oh, it's okay. Well, then, 
I if can... it's helpful, maybe we can, well, we'll just wait a moment. I think it'll be there quickly. Thank you. And I will just say that um, the more otters that you can fill into a presentation, the better a mood the board is in for potential adoption. Just... Well, I'll say my personal favorite out of all those was the little sea snail that was on one of the earlier slides. It was it was very colorful sea snail. I, I appreciate it as well. <laughs> on this presentation, I wasn't paying close enough attention. I was looking at the words. <clears throat> Substance. We love it. I think it's coming up here. Okay, the first one is response number 2.04 which, as you can see, this is actually the second paragraph. Uh, the first sentence would remain the same. The second sentence would now read, the State Water Board may consider provisions to limit the impact of any proposed changes to the ocean plan desalination provisions on prior project applicants. And then the next slide, uh, this is 2.05, and um, it initially points back to the prior comment and goes on to state should the State Water Board direct staff to proceed with reviewing the desalination provisions, any projects with pending applications would be considered pursuant to the currently applicable provisions while revisions are developed and considered. So those two together, we think, better express the intent. The helpful clarification. Thank you. Seeing no questions now from board members, let's go to public comment cards and then perhaps there'll be some question or further comment. I'd like to call up Stan Williams from Poseidon Water, who will be followed by uh, Lori Rigby from the city of Oceanside. Is the mic on? Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, we don't usually try to test our public commenters at the start of their comment. All right. Good morning. No, sorry, one moment. Let me, I, I think the microphone itself may not be. Now it's on, I think. Right, we again? Here we are. Thank you. Okay, well, that was a good warm up anyway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> good morning, Stan Williams with Poseidon Water. Um, I have no waters, um, no slides. Actually, we didn't get our written comments in, in fact, in time. But I appreciate the chance to make a few oral comments. I want to go back um, to the board meeting in September where you considered a proposal uh, for a fee to be applied to desal facilities as they got their water code consistency determination. And you had staff uh, recommendation, you had three options. Um, you reached uh, understanding through discussion that there was a dearth of information on resource impacts to really make a decision. So you found a, a good middle ground. Uh, and you actually challenged staff at that point to take a year or two to actually collect the impact data or what the resources were being used. And I thought that was a very uh, beneficial uh, uh, direction given by the board. And staff said they would. And so what I wanted to say is that to me, It's okay, you're, you're paused on time right now. Yeah, sorry for the technical difficulty there. there you go. Okay, let's see, we're on now again. Okay, the, um, since that time, there's really been only one uh, action taken that would give more information. That was the recent tentative order on our Huntington Beach desal project. There haven't been any, uh, of project applications that I'm aware of that have been actually processed for projects that are smaller or that use different technology, subsurface intakes, the preferred uh, options from the water code. Um, so it seems premature to me that we would be looking at revising uh, the, the desal amendment prior to getting that kind of information. And, and so that 
it, it would seem logical that the information would be gathered over the next few years and, the, and that review could take place. However, um, it's not clear that there will be much activity even next year. I think maybe we could have a, the Doheny project from South Coast might get their application in next year. They're planning on it. They're a small project that uses the preferred technology. So that would be a good source of information. Unfortunately, you, as you know, CalAM's project, a similar small project with preferred technology, got derailed at the Coastal Commission when the staff recommended denial based upon impacts to groundwater and the high cost of the, the water that would be produced. So that's kind of been bay, at, in bay it's, we don't know if that'll go forward or not. What I want to say though is that even though the review may not go forward, with that issue all listed as a high priority issue, uh, it creates a chilling effect. It's kind of like instant replay on TV sports where there's a review of a decision and everything kind of stops while that goes on. Same thing with the projects that are moving through the pipeline if there's this identified high priority need to change the game. So we appreciate the, the recommended changes that the staff has presented, but even they may not go far enough. So we support the Caldicell comment about essentially putting this item over to the next triennial review, getting it out of the spotlight of high priority status. Um, for that for a reason, the private investors and public board members making decisions on these projects, it's, it creates uncertainty. And they don't know what the rules are gonna be by the time they get their project developed. California needs consistency, and you did that with the desal amendment. Um, and, and even though there's parts of it that are hard to, for us to live with and work with, uh, we've been able to do that. There's one other area I want to comment on, and Chair Esquivel, at the September meeting, you related the activity uh, to the water resiliency portfolio issue. Is seawater desal going to be part of California's future and part of that portfolio or not? And in my opinion, just even listening that you need to do another review of an amendment you just made in the last few years creates uncertainty in that process as well. Can you really count on, de on seawater desal as part of the resiliency portfolio if we can't settle on what the regulations are? So I appreciate the time uh, to make those comments and, and we've enjoyed the last several years working with your staff and the regional board staffs um, on these projects, and we hope to go continue. And we do think it's important that if the review does start, and that the projects that have been in the pipeline are grandfathered under the current regulations uh, and not have some other state agency use the fact that there's a pending review as a basis for delay of their approval. Thanks again. Thank you for your comments. Next, I'd like to call up Laura, Laura, Lori Rigby from the city of Oceanside, followed by Wendy Ritter, Ritterbotch uh, from Ritterbotch Strategies. Hello, board members, staff members. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, my name is Lori Rigby. I'm the compliance officer with the city of Oceanside. Um, we are an ocean discharger um, to the Pacific Ocean. Um, and I am here today to talk about our concern with the direct incorporation of the test of significant toxicity into the chronic toxicity objectives, as this is not a promulgated method, and it is contrary to promulgated methods that are currently adopted in the ocean plan. This approach is currently subject to litigation with the EPA for encouraging the use of this approach over methods that have been subject and notice sorry, I've been subjected to notice and comment rulemaking, and the TST is not compliant with part 136. The data is contrary to the NPDES permit regulations, and it, can, and it cannot be used for compliance determinations. This is not recommended in the West Coast Methods, EPA 600R-95-136, and that currently states that this needs an alternative test procedure, which has not happened for the TST method. The current requirements are promulgated and they provide reliable data and the TST should be removed from the work plan or dropped down in the importance to a low priority. 
The regional boards have already incorporated this into 21 ocean discharger permits, and they are not following their own rules or the adopted ocean plan. The state board would benefit from telling the regional boards to comply and follow their own ocean plan. The board has the duty to ensure the regional boards are following the basin plans and the ocean plans. Contrary permits should be opened and made compliant with the current ocean plan. The uh, comments were due in August 2019 for um, this work plan, and we did not receive our administrative draft of our permit, and the public notice was not until October, and this was in our draft permit, which is currently up for adoption next week. So I wanted to just take this time to address the board about the concern of the TSD, the fact that it is not a promulgated method in Rule 136, and that it does need to comply with the ATP to be promulgated and properly adopted into the ocean plan if it is deemed appropriate. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Rigby, and thank you for taking the time to, to come all the way up here. Hi, could, I'm sorry, yeah. could, you, could you just um, clarify, you used an ATP, could you just explain what that is briefly? Uh, the alternative test procedure is a method with um, ensuring that they're meeting the EPA's rules to be an approved method. That is, um, it goes through an adoption process, implementation, it, it's to make sure that the test has gone through all the rigorous peer reviews and this method has not undergone those testing, the alternative test procedures, and it is currently not a recommended test within the chronic toxicity um, requirements. Thanks for clarifying. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. No, thank you. Ms. Ritterbush. Good morning. I'm doing this kind of one and a half legged, so bear with me. Good morning, uh, Chair Escabel, members of the board. I'm Wendy Ritterbush with Ritterbush Strategies, here today representing Cal Desal, a unified voice for desalination and salinity management in our Golden State. We want to start by thanking the board for including stakeholders' uh, input. Uh, during, uh, including Cal Desal, obviously, during the drafting of the Ocean Plan Desal Amendment, which was just three short years ago. Um, at that time, the State Water Board itself determined that an MOU between the board and other state agencies needed to be entered into in order to streamline and implement the desal facility permitting process. That has not yet been completed, although there was a reference in the comments to an MOA, but we really believe it would be beneficial to follow through with that goal. Um, moving ahead with a formal ocean plan amendment process less than five years after its adoption seems premature. What happens to those projects painstakingly working their way through the permitting process now? We believe those projects should be given pipeline status, but will they? Project proponents don't want to feel that the goalposts are being moved uh, with the opening of a long amendment process when our members right now are laser-like focused on planning, designing, building, and operating critical water supply projects. So any amendment to the rules and regulations right now would be technically obstructive from the perspective of the project owners and operators. We do appreciate the proposed revision to the responses that was uh, brought up by staff today. We, we believe that's really an acknowledgement from staff that the concern is real on this. We respectfully hope you'll consider revisiting the desalination element after progress has been made on administratively clarifying, streamlining, and expediting the permit process and improving the internal interagency coordination. We oppose the adoption of this formal staff report and work plan today. Our members will continue to shape and shepherd responsible desal projects to help support the demonstrated need for a balanced, sustainable, and resilient, diverse water portfolio for the future of California. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, I'd like to call up Mr. Mark Gold from the California Ocean Protection Council, followed by Caitlin Kalua from California Coastkeeper Alliance. Before you do that, can I just ask a question? Course, I think means, rather sure. than just to get some clarification from the uh, 
last speaker, last commenter. So the concern about an administrative um, process versus a full-blown amendment, um, could you speak to that? Because as I read, and I don't have the exact language before me, but um, what you've committed to in the plan, what we have is just considering developing an amendment. We're not committing necessarily to developing an amendment uh, to clarify and streamline the permitting process. So would it be, an, I assume it would be an option as you go through the stakeholder process, if there's an administrative route, uh, you could pursue that uh, rather than having to um, actually amend the plan, correct? Yeah, you are correct, yes. Okay. So, uh, can I just jump in real quick and, and say that um, for the last three years on the desal amendment work, um, there's been lots of issues and concerns about how difficult it is, how um, how much trouble people have had in complying with the permit. Um, we've had multiple meetings with applicants on this issue. Um, the reason that we considered putting it on there was to see if there was ways to address those issues and streamline that process. We're not um, committing to doing that. What we're committing to doing is to try and figure out if there's a better way to do this that doesn't require the level of resources both from the applicant, the regional boards, and the state board. That was our expectation. I, Thank I you, would Vice like Chair. to further offer one um, point in response to the previous speaker that there is a reference in the original adopting resolution talking about pursuing a, a memorandum of understanding or agreement with other agencies in order to um, shape how the agencies will work together on permitting these types of facilities. And we are almost there. We have some uh, we we have the, the draft out to the other agencies for signature. We've heard that at least one of the federal agencies is going to be a little longer to getting signed than we had hoped, but that is in place and it will address how the agencies work together. It doesn't, we believe, address some of these underlying difficulties that Mr. Bishop was just speaking to. Thank you for those clarifications and thank you for the question, Vice Chair. Mr. Gold. Uh, good morning. My name's uh, Dr. Mark Gold. I'm executive director of the Ocean Protection Council, as well as uh, deputy secretary um, for ocean and coastal policy um, in the um, Department of Resources. So these are my first comment. My first comments on the ocean plan were actually way back in 1988. So um, I've been doing this for a while. And on behalf of the Ocean Protection Council, we strongly support the priorities set in the ocean plan review. We are grateful to the time the State Water Resources Control Board um, staff spent in going over our comments. Um, they met with us uh, um, and talked to us multiple times. As you may know, the Ocean Protection Council is finalizing the Coast and Ocean Strategic Plan for California with comments due on December 13th and a final vote on approval of that plan at the Ocean Protection Council meeting on February 27th um, next year right here in Sacramento. Within the plan, in conjunction with communications with your staff, are numerous objectives, targets, and actions that are consistent with ocean plan high and very high priorities, including but not limited to um, objective 1.2, which is minimizing the causes and impacts of ocean acidification and hypoxia. Um, so talking about that in particular, um, our agency has probably spent close to $2 million on research um, related to ocean acidification hypoxia, um, and we've worked very closely with your staff, um, and there's a wide variety of different recommendations in the strategic plan that are sort of related to that. Um, finishing the science up and getting to the point, if necessary, of developing a regulatory approach on how to stem the impacts of ocean acidification hypoxia. Um, and I'm sure you've been updated um, to, to know that um, based on extensive modeling um, done by UCLA, Squirp, University of Washington, NOAA, it's really looking like anthropogenic sources um, from the coast are disproportionately impacting um, our coast and ocean on ocean acidification hypoxia at a regional basis. So a lot more needs to be done there, but um, uh, something that um, we think is definitely should be a very high priority. Another area um, that's um, on your list is a high priority, we think should be a, a very one, high one, is microplastics. Um, this is also an issue 
um, with all the uh, state water boards leadership on plastics has been quite extraordinary. Um, on microplastics, we have um, a legislative mandate to actually develop a strategy by 2021. Um, and we'll work with your staff in doing so. So obviously a high priority there. One of the things I, I also want to um, bring up on ocean acidification hypoxia is that a lot of this is nutrient driven. Um, and so other sorts of impacts like harmful algal blooms um, would be related to that, um, to any sort of regulatory outcome uh, that comes from a review process. Um, we also want to highlight uh, the state water quality protection areas on um, general protection. Uh, once the cooling has spent millions of dollars on uh, MPA funding to try to get them to be more productive and to better understand how well they're working. Um, we'd like to work closely with your staff um, to better understanding um, really relationship between MPAs and water quality. Um, first step would be mapping the ASBSs and the MPAs to identify um, uh, those MPAs that could benefit from additional protection um, under, under the um, state water quality protection areas. Um, really there hasn't been much movement on that and um, so we'd like to help in moving that forward. We'd be glad to work with your staff on that issue as well as the desalination implementation provisions, anything to do with bacterial objectives, both recreational and shellfish and tribal beneficial uses related to marine resources. The Ocean Protection Council will continue to work closely with State Water Resources Control Board staff on critical ocean plan issues. We'll strategically provide funding for research and policy discussion efforts on those issues highlighted in the Coast and Ocean Strategic Plan. Our hope is that our collab collaboration will lead to regulatory actions as needed to reduce the impacts of marine pollution on coastal water quality, public health, and marine ecosystem health. Thank you. Thank you very much. And All right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Next, I'd like to call up, actually, uh, Melissa Thorne, whose card fell at the bottom of my stack on accident, from Fallbrook Public Utility District. And then we'll wrap up with Caitlin Kalua from California Coast Keeper. Good morning, board members, staff, uh, I am Melissa Thorne from Downey Brand here today appearing on behalf of the Fallbrook Public Utilities District, which is a small inland wastewater treatment facility, but actually is an ocean discharger. They use Oceanside's outfall, as do several others. So Fallbrook was not aware of the work plan and the requirements and the early comment deadline in August. They It wasn't on their radar. And they didn't know about this issue G item until they received their draft permit that's an ocean discharge permit, which contains the test of significant toxicity. It's set to be adopted next week. And this is contrary to the very clear provisions of the ocean plan of how you're supposed to write permits. And um, they were told about this work plan as potentially justifying the change in the permit, which you know, that one of the things that was discussed by staff today as part of your resolution is that a clarification that the ocean plan is still effective. So um, upon some more research, we found that there's more than 25 ocean discharge permits in regions one, four, and nine that include the TST instead of the ocean plan requirements. So the question is, is why is the board spending all this time amending the ocean plan? Nobody's even following it. The work plan also seems to ignore that these people are breaking the rules and instead are changing the rules to make these wrongs seem compliant, which seems a little backwards. The staff report at page five of the work plan says that, quote, the issue descriptions contained in the staff report and work plan do not presuppose any associated project actions or substance, end quote. However, issue G, if you look at it, directs replacement of the current ocean plan, no observable effect concentration and the toxicity unit approach with the TST. That is merely a 2010 guidance document that's never been formally adopted by EPA. So, um, and uh, test methods are required under the Clean Water Act 304H to be adopted. So we request removal of the direction that this be changed to include the TST and instead request that you just have a review of the toxicity provisions 
which is part of the triennial review process and periodic review required under state and federal law anyway, and that this be a lower priority item. I know you're struggling with the toxicity provisions in the inland surface waters and closed bays and estuaries, and so it seems like we should figure out what we're doing there first before we change. But if consistency is one of the goals, then one suggestion would be the ocean plan already has toxicity provisions, why don't we put that into the Inland Surface Waters Plan and then it would be consistent that way. But I think it is a problem that the board needs to maybe take up some petitions on its own motion where these permits are being adopted that are clearly contrary to the ocean plan, because that is a problem. Thank you. Very much for your comments, Ms. Thorne. Next, I'd like to call up Caitlin Kalua from California Coast Keeper. Perfect. Let's see. Is there a perfect? A little clicker. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right. Well, good morning. Um, my name is Caitlin Kalua. I'm the policy analyst with the California Coastkeeper Alliance. With me today is Carrie Sesh, who's a legal extern visiting from Vermont Law School, and um, these comments are also jointly submitted by Heal the Bay. I'd like to include them as well. So, beginning, saying first. Thank you to your staff for their hard work in getting this plan before you today. Um, we see, well, not only we see, this plan is a key tool in efforts to protect the health of our coast and ocean and to protect our investment, our California's investment in the marine protected area network. We thank your staff uh, for working with us and others to include a um, variety of priority projects that are listed as high and very high, including these four here. I do want to say that there are other projects that we strongly support. Um, including the incorporation of the TST method in the Ocean Plan Amendment, but given limited staff resources and time, we understand um, within your oceans unit, these are the four that we'd like to highlight today. Beginning with ocean acidification and hypoxia, we strongly um, encourage this as a high priority within the Ocean Plan um, to be undertaken by your staff in the coming years. Ocean acidification and hypoxia is, um, are increasingly present in our coastal waters and having a devastating ability to decimate shell fisheries as PhD decreases and as the ocean becomes more acidic. OA levels are expected to uh, grow nearly 150% by the end of the century. Um, and while decreasing carbon emissions is the number one way to manage this um, acidification of our oceans, there are uh, actions California can take now to protect its coastline. This in includes controlling the source, uh, sources of land-based pollution that feeds uh, this ocean acidification's growth. The State Water Board should prioritize setting a new OAH water quality objective using the best available science. Uh, we thank Mark Gold for his comments today um, with, that, are act that are consistent with the 2016 West Coast Ocean Acidification um, Hypoxia Science Panel recommendations um, that, again, were released in 2016. So again, we'd like to see this move forward. Uh, further, there's new criteria to assess coastal water quality um, that have not been in place for decades since they first, the criteria were first adopted. Um, and we'd like to see this um, move forward. We don't want to be four decades behind. Um, water, criteria, water quality criteria such as pH, et cetera, should be included when addressing coastal water quality. We urge uh, your board to not delay in the development of this objective. And while we uh, sincerely agree with the staff report, uh, your staff has the assessment that uh, more research, of course, is needed to develop an appropriate um, water quality objective for ocean acidification and hypoxia. We firmly believe this research can be done concurrently um, with the development of this objective. We've already seen this done with your board's development of a desalination and ocean plan amendment, which um, was assessing the impacts to marine life concurrently as that, um, amendment was adopted five years ago. There are expert panels in place to actually calculate and assess those marine life impacts, and we encourage a similar approach be done here with ocean acidification and hypoxia. Moving on to desalination, another uh, it's ranked as very high under your ocean plan. We agree with this ranking, um, and critically, we urge you, your board, and your staff to prioritize the prompt revision of this desalination amendment um, to ensure it is centered around the best available technology to minimize the um, impact to marine life caused by ocean desalination. The current uh, desalination amendment allows numerous exemptions, loopholes, and general ambiguities, which have led to project proposals, including one uh, proposal in Huntington Beach that will be reviewed by the regional board this Friday, 
that will perpetuate the significant harm to marine life that was once thought to be addressed by the once through cooling policy, that is, to prevent the death of marine life caused by the intake of seawater. Alarmingly, projects are being considered after the adoption of your board's desalination amendment that use the same exact infrastructure as former power plants that spent millions to be taken offline, um, to be offline within accordance with the OTC policy. We see the practice of open ocean intakes as an unacceptable practice that continues um, after the fact that your staff has determined subsurface intakes to be, in fact, the best available and preferred technology to minimize the harm to marine life. We strongly urge your board maintain this revision uh, to the desalination amendment as a very high priority moving forward and to amend the textual ambiguities that allow projects to move forward that have an alarming impact on California's coast. Thank you. Hello, my name's Carrie Sesh. As far as the um, ASBS program, the Areas of Special Biological Significance program was developed in the 1970s to protect the water quality of California's most special biologically diverse marine systems, ecosystems. Unfortunately, updates to the ocean plan intended to address, address the ongoing discharges into these areas and meet natural water quality have largely failed. The failure is in large part due to rampant noncompliance through the network. According to our review of this program, in 2012, the State Water Board approved the 27 general exception permits, which include the 16 municipalities, seven Caltrans sites, three private companies, and three Department of Defense sites. And of those sites, 14 of the 16 municipalities have shown natural water quality exceedances, and this number doesn't include one site, which we had no data for. And seven of the seven Caltrans sites have shown natural water quality exceedances. Three of these private company sites have shown natural water quality exceedances. And two of the three DOD sites have shown natural water quality exceedances. Of the 27 general exception permits, only 33% of the permitted discharge, um, dischargers submitted final compliance plans, and 14 out of the 20 plans are still draft compliance plans, as listed on the State Water Board website. These plans were never updated and resubmitted to the State Water Board with the 2013 to 15 comments incorporated. There are also issues with all final and draft and compliance plans, including um, that only six of the 20 final plans have been submitted since 2012. The compliance plan length ranges from three pages to 231 pages, of which none provide justification for the exceedances. And the compliance plans show no plan for noncompliance. Many plans say that in the event of noncompliance, they'll submit a written report to the State Water Board within 30 days, but give no enforcement plan beyond that. The natural water quality testing is also inconsistent across the board. Between 2009 and 2019, permitted dischargers have conducted anywhere between two and 15 natural water quality tests. We urge your board to strengthen the enforcement to adequately determine compliance with ASBS exceptions. The lack of oversight has allowed for noncompliance. General exception, exception dischargers need to be held to their compliance plans, including turning in finalized plans, establishing guidelines for compliance within the plans, and bringing their ASBS sites into compliance. The consistent water testing standards, monitoring guidelines, and compliance plan guidelines must be established to reduce the occurrence of exceedances. Current plans do not include non-compliant sections. These sections should outline a plan of action in, case, in the case of an exceedance, which includes outlining discharges causing exceedances, discharge reduction plan, compliance schedule, consistent water quality testing, and monitoring of the ASBS sites. And third, we want to establish a compliance schedule for the ASBS exceedances with interim milestones for those that are unable to comply with the ASBS exception policy. As that in doing that, we would you would establish a minimum number of samples per year, the result which will be accounted for by the State Water Board and account for possible drought year sampling minimums. We are also concerned with the shellfish harvesting beneficial uses. The Water Board objectives for protecting shellfish harvesting are sorely outdated and are not in line with current science. Adopting a fecal coliform standard for shellfish harvesting areas was identified as a high priority in the 2011 Ocean Plan Triennial Review Work Plan. However, little progress has been made toward that goal. 
Following the State Water Board's adoption of the updated bacteria provisions in August of 2018, we urge the State Water Board to prioritize the development of bacterial standards to protect commercial beneficial shellfish uses. In addition to these four priority projects, that being the OAH object, objective, the desalination impl implementation, ASBS reform, and a bacteria objective for commercial shellfish, we strongly recommend the State Water Board provide guidance to the regional boards to create water quality protections for marine protected areas using the State Water Quality Protection Areas Program. All current state water quality protection areas are overlaid with ASBSs, which were originally established in the 1970s and no new sites have been created since then. Further, despite an addition of a state water quality protection area general protection category in the ocean plan in 2012, no regional water board has used its authority to designate new state water quality protected areas. This is an unfortunate missed opportunity to strengthen coastal water quality for existing marine protected areas. I may finish. And we urge your board to review of the state water quality protected area designation process to determine what procedural obstacles exist and to offer guidance to the regional water boards to encourage the actual designation of these areas. We look forward to engaging with your staff as these priority projects move forward following the adoption of today's triennial review. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions from or comments from fellow board members? Um, Hi. Hi, thank you. Um, on the, with regard to the ASBS project, um, do you think, do you feel that there's more that can be done to address ASBS compliance plans and some of the exceedances that have been found um, without going through a review process in the ocean plan, but with the plans and permits as they currently exist today? Uh, Carrie did a deep dive into the compliance plans. I think, I mean, as far as a mechanism, absolutely welcome any other um, initiative. I'm just trying to think of the mechanism that could be done to take a look at individual compliance plans, improve that process. Um, I'd, I'd encourage it. Maybe that's a question for staff. Okay, so, so this is, I'll just add Rebecca Fitzgerald of your staff that I kind of consider probably the next step on this to be a larger scale programmatic review um, that could potentially take us down the road of a rulemaking amendment to the ocean plan. It could look at how we're implementing our, our, our program now, but I think um, it would be a, a broader scale review. Um, just start and then see where that takes us. So uh, I'd just like to add that we, um, <clears throat> when we adopted the special exceptions provisions in, um, for the ASBS, we included some very specific timelines that all are all gone. Um, they were for a specific three-year period um, of monitoring, a specific time for compliance. Um, that seemed to make sense at the time, but then we went into a drought and it changed lots of things. It seems like, um, from my point of view, we need to um, make the requirements in the ASBS ongoing and not a specific time frame to come into compliance um, that leaves us in a, a awkward position when we're beyond that time frame and um, and beyond the specific requirements in it. So I think there does need to be some review of the ocean plan. I think there needs to be some uh, look at how we deal with that compliance issue and we need to make it general instead of specific to a time frame from 2012 to 15. I agree. I mean, it is discouraging to, a little bit to hear, you know, I, understanding the drought was a major factor in this, but the fact that the plans were required um, and drafted, and then it sounds like in many cases, maybe, maybe not even finalized, and they're still in draft format, or it's maybe unclear where they currently stand today. So it's very difficult to evaluate, you know, what the com current compliance status really even is. And so, you know, I agree. I, I think this is, you know, indicative of, you know, a bigger challenge that we have in ensuring compliance with permits and exceptions as they're, as they're um, issued. So, you know, I'd be very interested in hearing what else can be done, in, you know, just recognizing the fact that th there's a long list of projects here in the Ocean Plan Triennial, Triennial, Triennial Review, which is why I'm trying to understand better what other uh, options there might be in the toolbox, knowing that, you know, it sounds like you may only be able to take on one or two projects 
uh, over the next three years or so. Um, so if we could have some concurrent activities to look at these ASBS compliance plans, figure out where they're at, and you know what can we do to daylight some of these issues that have been identified, I think that would be incredibly helpful. Thanks. Thank you, board member. Thank you. I have one more comment card. I'd like to call up Sherry Norris from the California Indian Environmental Alliance. Good morning. Hello, good morning. Um, I'll be very brief. Um, we actually, the California Indian Environmental Alliance um, is in support of this um, ocean plan update. We're really happy to see the tribal subsistence um, fishing and cultural use in there. We're also happy to see the consideration of shell, the, under the shellfish. Um, just wanted to let you guys know of a couple pieces that are going on for the water board um, to know of, um, that there is a red abalone and kelp um, effort going on with the a fishing game and tribes are engaging in that process. And then also um, our organization, the California Indian Environmental Alliance received a small grant from Cal EPA, the, an EJ grant, to include increase tribal participation in both the ocean plan update after you guys choose to hopefully to adopt this today. And then also for the Central Valley, San Francisco Bay and the North Coast. And so we're working with the tribal coordinators of those efforts and we're, we're in support of, of this. And um, the outreach for the ocean plan update, um, a lot of the tribes that were engaged were the ones in Clear Lake and we would like to see an expansion of the outreach along coastal tribes and we can help with that. So thank you. I have a question for you and perhaps for staff also, um, just in keeping with the, the questions that uh, we've been posing uh, so far about what can be done in the meantime. So on uh, tribal beneficial uses, what strikes me is just um, posting and uh, what can be done in the meantime while the uh, definition is uh, being uh, changed. So uh, I have one more thing, if it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, regarding the changes, um, when we we did four years of outreach and coordination with this through the Central Valley Mercury, um, um, there was a big long title, but you know what I'm you know the one I'm, which I'm speaking. Um, in that in doing that outreach, um, the tribes were considering the ocean plan update at the same time as they were considering the inland, recognizing there's anadromous fish that move back and forth between the oceans and the rivers. And so um, the tribes that we spoke to at this point are don't think there would need to be a change for tribal beneficial uses for subsistence or um, cultural regarding the ocean, but we're we would like to be part of those conversations when they do move forward. Great, thank you so much, and thank you for the work that you do in sharing with us uh, some of the uh, development. I think Rebecca has something to add. Oh, oh, sorry. I was just going to respond, um, Board Member Diamo, to your thought about the posting and. Um, I think statewide there's some effort that's underway in order to try to get some cons fi you know, fish consumption notification postings put up where we may have mercury contaminated fish or fish contaminated with other bioaccumulatives. And I think that that's a worthwhile effort and I know that we're exploring trying to get funding for uh, county health organizations to get that posting up. Um, and yeah, I think that that can go through separate from any effort to specifically designate or add definitions for tribal subsistence fishing um, to the ocean plan and potentially designate some of our coastal waters with those uses. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you again. Any further sort of discussion and dialogue from fellow board members? Mr. Right. Board Member Wire. Thank you. So thank you very much for the presentation today. It's um, very informative and I, I really do applaud everything that's been accomplished over the last, you know, from the last trial review, the number of really critical amendments um, that have been uh, imparted, you know, are, are very useful. And it's, I, I know that you have a small team, uh, you know, limited resources, and it's been a big lift to get to where we are today. And so, you know, a lot of uh, what I look at is, you know, it's important to not only go through the amendment process where it makes sense and look at, at changes to the plan, but also be able to reflect back and look at you know, what's already in place to be able to you know, learn from those experiences. And so that's where some of my comments are, you know, looking at the ASBS, you know, other changes that have been adopted in the plan 
um, you know, what can we do without going through the amendment process? Just recognizing um, your limited resources on that and, you know, the extensive stakeholder engagement efforts that are needed. So, you know, I, I find that when I'm, I'm looking at this list, um, it's, you know, you say you may be able to take up one or two of these projects in the next three years. And, you know, I recognize this is a triennial review and, and some of these projects are multi-year projects. And in fact, some of them, the research is, is already underway. But I find myself wanting to hear back at some point um, in terms of what projects are actually selected because this work plan is so open-ended. You know, I think we've, we've had other discussions about some of even the medium priority projects about how they might be bundled um, because some of them are, are more of a low-hanging fruit um, in terms of bringing aspects of the ocean plan up to current, you know, federal standards that, um, you know, that could be bundled with some of the higher priority items. And so, you know, I would be, I don't know what the right time frame is, but for you to come back maybe in a year or, or whenever it makes the most sense to you to just report back as to what projects you actually select and think are worthy of moving forward through then the, you know, the review process, um, just to keep informed on these issues because it is a pretty broad uh, list that we have here. And, and on that, um, uh, I appreciate, uh, Secretary, Assistant Secretary, is that Gold, um, <laughs> Deputy, uh, uh, your, your comments on um, ocean acidification and hypoxia and microplastics. Um, it sounds like there's wiggle room within the priorities um, as they currently are, whether it's a very high or high priority, um, you could take on, the board could take on any of those projects. So I, I would support certainly to the extent that you're continuing to coordinate with Ocean Protection Council Squirp and others on the research and accelerating and moving those processes forward. Um, you know, I would support continuing to move that. I don't think necessarily I need to say let's move that to a high priority today, but certainly it's it's a, a high priority interest to me to understand and know that those projects are are moving along um, through the research process and to the extent that um, any of the initial steps in the um, in the regulatory process are able to be better defined, I would be interested in that as well. Uh, and then I also wanted to discuss briefly uh, issue G on the toxicity water quality objectives. Um, I appreciated the comments from Fallbrook and Oceanside about their concerns with regard to um, kind of the current state of toxicity objectives for ocean discharges. And I, rec I just, I've been learning more about this over the last couple of days, so I'm processing this information, but just understanding that, you know, a number of um, regional board uh, permits already have incorporated the TST into those permits, and yet um, I admittedly, you know, those appear not to be currently consistent with the current version of the ocean plan. So it, it is a concern for me um, that in some cases, um, it sounds like some of these permits are getting ahead of statewide policy. And so I just want to tread carefully here in terms of how we move forward with this um, process. And then recognizing that the inland surface waters um, toxicity provisions are still in development, have not yet been adopted by the board. Um, you know, and this is a, you know, a three-year triennial review. I would say that once you look at potential adoption of the inland provisions by the board and then implementation um, effectiveness of, of that and then providing some time then to better understand how how well that process goes and what what tweaks there may be um, you know by that time you know we may be in the next triennial review cycle for the ocean plan um, you know I, I just I am all for consistency uh, but I want to make sure we do this thoughtfully and carefully we're able to engage stakeholders along the way. Um, so to that, to that extent, I, I'd be, you know, I, I'm interested to hear that board members, um, if, if other board members have ideas about this, but I'm, I'm certainly open to either revising the priority of this um, or broadening the language on issue G a bit so it speaks not just necessarily directly to the TST, but more broadly to the water quality objectives themselves. Um, just recognize that there may be other 
developments you know, over the coming years that could be reflected through this review. I appreciate that. So um, a big bunch of uh, discussion there, but um, I think that there's a couple of things that we should um, discuss or think about. One is it sounds like what you would like, and maybe the other board members also, is that as we um, consider implementing or beginning implementing any of these projects, that we have an, uh, a briefing and an update for the board members that, that you know, we're starting down that process and making sure that that this is the right one to start at this point in time. Um, I think that is totally appropriate. We, we're likely um, to be working on multiple ones at the same time um, because all these projects take a long time. Um, we're not going to stop working on things like following the science in OA. We've been working with that group for years with the Ocean Protection Council and the Ocean Science Trust. We have um, work on microplastics that's being done by the Ocean Protection Council and Squirp that we are involved in. Um, and um, I also, so I, um, there are things that are ongoing and we can give you a, a better understanding of where we are in those different pieces. Um, the, um, you're welcome, of course, to change the, um, the, um, priority on um, on any of them, but I would say that th there's no expectation that staff is going to immediately start working on toxicity while the toxicity is going on in the inland. Um, they would be the same people. Um, so there would be, I don't think you should expect us to be running off and starting on that now. It's likely that we, it, well, it's guaranteed that we won't start on that until we um, get direction from the board on the inland surface water plan, and then we would look to to make that um, more consistent. I'll just jump in and say that I do appreciate Board Member McGuire um, suggesting a, a report back, just generally speaking. And um, I'd be interested not just in the priorities, um, but also just an update. Um, with respect to all of the priorities, including any activity on, you know, the medium or low priority activities, just because there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of components to each one of these. I mean, I look at one item that's at the bottom, you know, it says low priority, but vessel discharges and invasive species. And I know we've got Michael George here, Delta Water Master, and uh, the lead scientist from uh, the Delta Stewardship Council, and invasive species, you know, from the Bay carry over into the Delta. So it's a very um, uh, important priority issue, uh, maybe in some other aspects. And so I, I'm assuming that there might even be some work being done with by regional boards. So um, anything to just uh, uh, report back, including on the um, compliance issue that was raised earlier, and I'd be interested in an update. I know the stakeholders would too um, on the MOU um, and MOAs on DSAL. So just um, whatever you, you think is appropriate in um, in terms of reporting back on some of the specifics, and then of course, as Board Member McGuire indicated, uh, the the priority. And with respect to um, toxicity. Um, the only thing that I would suggest is, um, and, and I agree, uh, Mr. Bishop, that it's the same staff that would be working on both, so it'd be unlikely, but just um, some assurance that staff wouldn't begin working on it until, and I know we're sort of jumping ahead here, but uh, uh, we do expect that, um, some of us expect that uh, when we have toxicity before us, that we would be including that report. and. Um, uh, at the study and a report back on the study. And so it seems that it wouldn't um, uh, be the right uh, timing to move forward on the ocean piece until after that report comes back because I suspect a lot of those same issues would be raised anyway. So, so um, just my I, thoughts on toxicity. Just quickly, I just want to make sure that we're not um, uh, mixing messages, but I do believe that the report is about the sensitivity of, of the Seriodaphnia. Is Seriodaphnia an ocean uh, 
No, I didn't think so. So it's hey, not I one of the corrected. species, <laughs> but that's fine. I, you, you notice I had to ask to make sure because I wasn't sure either. Um, but yes, I'll commit that we are not going to start on working on ocean um, um, plan, any ocean plan amendments for toxicity until we've um, uh, made the decisions and heard from the board on their uh, direction for toxicity in, in the surface waters plan. I'll add my thanks for your hard work on this. I appreciate the comments made by my colleagues and uh, I'm mindful that this is a planning document and that it does a very good job of laying out all the various projects and some proposed priorities based on the, the factors that was used and obviously how things play out will depend a lot on real life, on real resources mm -hmm. and on what happens you know, as the board and staff juggle with the many projects and, and challenges that come our way. Uh, but I do appreciate, again, at the very comprehensive work that you did, at the laying out of the projects, the initial list of prioritization, um, and I concur with the need for briefings before you move forward, as I know you always do. Um, and I, you know, would uh, strongly encourage our adoption of this item and would move for its adoption with the proposed changes. Thank you, board members. Echo my thanks as well to staff. You know, I know that the unit isn't a very large unit, but it does uh, do a remarkable job of engaging with our sister agencies, um, staying on top of what is, as we can see from the priorities document, uh, a very broad set of issues that are impacting. And I think that what I'm hearing from the board members is a, a greater desire to understand that work. Um, I think we, rightfully so perhaps, are sometimes really focused on inland waters. Um, they can mm -hmm. sometimes generate, you know, some of our most enduring sort of political conflicts, uh, conflicts for sure. But I think that uh, our work on the oceans side of things on the ocean plan and near near uh, coast water quality is really critical. Um, and so I think we, we want to see a little more check-in. I would welcome not just sort of one more moment to, to touch base, but maybe a couple. Um, and they can be on topics that are a little more specific and sort of delve into some of the issues that might be there. So I would welcome that. And then certainly when it comes to each of the uh, issues that may be actually moved forward on within the uh, plan review, you know, uh, as uh, Board Member Dodek uh, noticed or uh, mentioned, we um, we always get those sort of briefings, so we ap uh, appreciate that. With that, I don't think there's too much more. You know, when it comes to, you know, the other comment I would make is I, th I think the friction that we're we're sensing here is around sometimes again implementation, particularly with uh, issue G here, and you know, necessarily the TST being applied already by the regions to coastal permits, it seems. We'll, we'll dig into that a bit more. Uh, again, I think that ultimately um, the, the, it is a, a matter of how we continue to make sure that we stay on top of implementation of uh, what we have on the books, how we, how we better as a sort of you know, programmatic wide um, stay on top of, um, again, the, the implementation side of, of the work knowing that this is a planning exercise and a planning discussion that we're having here. So, you know, trying to parse out those two, again, I think a desire to have more check-in, a little more understanding of the ongoing work that staff are, are having. We have also have a priorities discussion that we're in the middle of. I think that that can also help inform and be part of it as we understand, you know, this unit's work and the priorities within it uh, for the coming year, but then also as it tees up, as we know, for all these issues, um, which are all these multiple years, uh, endeavors usually. Well, with that, I appreciate it. I believe we have a motion. And so I would welcome a, a second if there is one. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries and the uh, ocean plan uh, review is adopted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, staff, again. Really appreciate it. I will go ahead and give us a, a 15 minute break now. Um, and then we'll take up item informa informational item number eight and uh, board member reports. So, thank you. So we'll be back here uh, 1130.
Okay, I think we're ready to start back up. And now we'll start with, where, where's my agenda? Sorry, one moment. Item number eight, which of course is our quarterly update. Good to see you, Mr. George. Good morning, Michael George, Delta Watermaster, and I'm here uh, just to be uh, John Calloway's wingman for his quarterly report. But I do want to say that um, this quarterly report not only provides its uh, primary benefit of acquainting you with kind of what's new and, and where we are in terms of science, but I will say that there is an added benefit of increased communication and collaboration between our staff and the science staff uh, at the Stewardship Council. Um, and uh, John will get into a number of, of these issues, but I do want to say that the closer connection between scientific inquiry and on the ground or on the water management questions has been one of the real advantages of a routine quarterly process for having this uh, uh, presentation. So with that, John, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Michael. And I should note, Michael gave a presentation to the Stewardship Council just a few weeks ago, and similarly, I think they really appreciate hearing about the board's activities and all the, <clears throat> the communication definitely is appreciated both ways. So thank you, Chair Esquivel and board members for having me. And I know you, some of you are off to the aqua meeting soon, so. I'll try to move through items quickly, and then I'm happy to have a discussion and, and questions. Um, and so I have just an overview. I'm gonna talk about two, two recent issues, uh, critical issues for the council and for the, um, the DPIC, the Delta Plan Interagency Implementation Committee. There's two articles of interest I wanted to highlight for you, and then I'll talk about the, some recent conferences, the State of the Estuary Conference, and a recent symposium we put on, and then some upcoming issues. So first to start with the, um, the DPIC Science Funding and Governance Initiative. Um, this is an effort that's been going on for, uh, for over two years, actually right when I arrived to start my, my term as the lead scientist. It was out of the State of the Estuary meeting in 2017 that Randy Fiorini um, and a number of others were involved with a panel discussing the opportunities for science funding and um, in the, in, across the entire estuary. Out of that effort, uh, a, a year-long effort to develop a white paper that highlighted the importance of consistent funding for science and particularly for research that would go beyond the existing monitoring that's being done, because about 80% of the funding that goes to science in the Delta, we found, goes towards compliance monitoring. And what we have been trying to highlight is that that's really valuable and gives us enormous insight in terms of the condition of the Delta. But if we want to understand more about how to address the management questions, what's causing these changes or declines, we, we need to do targeted research as well. And so that's what the funding initiative um, has really been pushing for. <clears throat> so that we had a white paper that came out uh, in spring 2019 that the was presented to DPIC at that time and DPIC endorsed as the next step of, of moving forward on this issue, then they endorsed the development of an implementation plan. So um, a, a large group, about 40 to 50 of us, got together to work on the implementation plan. It was set up uh, with four different teams that addressed the four main recommendations that came out of the white paper. And then each group was, was tasked with identifying how can we implement those um, recommendations. And so out of that, uh, at, at the most recent DPIC meeting in early November, those recommendations were presented and an implementation report was presented to DPIC. What's highlighted on the slide there are the, the priority actions. So actually 15 actions were identified across the four teams. Michael George was the chair of one of the teams. Um, there were others, Mario Monzo from the Bureau of Reclamation, um, Bruce De Janeiro from CSAMP, the Collaborative Science and Adaptive Management Program, and Jay Lund from UC Davis. Hi, they, they led those groups along with staff from the science program and the Stewardship Council. Um, and so I just want to go through these priority actions. The first one was to um, imp improve our understanding of current funding within, for science within the Delta. And in order to do this, the, the action that was recommended was to implement uh, a template for common accounting and reporting protocols across all of the state and federal agencies so that we could um, 
have a much better idea. We, we, in our initial effort, we made an uh, estimate of, of funding on science, but everyone realized it was a crude estimate and we really need a much better estimate. We need a much better estimate of where that money is going. And then as part, once we have that, then the, the last part of that bullet is to coordinate a review of science funding and really evaluate, is it being used in an effective way? And I think this, although it seems like a relatively simple task, actually is a very significant task to coordinate all of that. Uh, um, budgeting information across all the agencies, and I know Chair Esquivel uh, pushed, uh, highlighted the importance of this and the commitment of staff that it will take at, at your board at, across all of the agencies to do this. But I think it really is critical because we need that data in order to make informed decisions about how we're spending our science dollars. So that was the that was the first um, effort, and that's moving forward. The, actually, um, Mario Monzo at the bureau has been has been leading this effort and the Bureau and DWR have been working together already, coordinating their budget, budgeting efforts and CDFW, your staff, um, our staff have all been contributing and, and um, I think this year I probably will have a, have, uh, will be our first effort. Um, it's being done on a calendar year, not a fiscal year since the feds and the state have different budgeting periods, but um, we're, uh, I think, at least by next year, I think we'll have a very, a much, much better understanding of, of where science funding is coming from and where it's going. So then the next effort is to address is exactly what Michael highlighted at the beginning of the presentation and the understanding the links between science issues and management questions. So we, we, the science action agenda is the, the um, document that the science program has developed with many other partners across the um, Delta to highlight the science that needs to be done beyond what is currently done by individual agencies. That the current science action agenda runs from 2017 to 2021. We're working already to think about how we're gonna update that starting for 2022. And so the prior, one, one of the key priorities there will be to not just identify the science issues, but clearly link them to management questions and identify not just the science needs, but the management questions for current challenges within the Delta. And then the third action is an action that the that Independent Science Board had really pushed for, and that's thinking about forward-looking science. So not just addressing current management challenges, but preparing the science program within the Delta so that we're addressing climate change, demographic changes, economic changes within the Delta on a much longer time scale, 10 to decades, 10 years to 30 to 50 years. And um, the, the Independent Science Board has made the case that we, we really aren't prepared in a scientific way. We aren't thinking about the appropriate tools and processes. So they've been pushing us to think on that sort of longer time frame. And as a part of this, the action coming out of this will be to hold a um, workshop in April to a, a science needs assessment around long-term science needs for the Delta. And this has been done for other systems, the Great Lakes, for Chesapeake Bay and the Everglades. It'll be modeled on some of those efforts. We're currently working, Jay Lund and Steve Brand from the Independent Science Board are leading this. And they're currently working, um, we're, a, a number of us are putting together a briefing paper to raise the issues and sort of set up the kinds of questions and issues that we hope to be discussed at that workshop. And that briefing paper probably will be out early in 2020 prior to the, um, the April workshop. So those are those three, um, three priority actions. If, if you have any questions on those issues, I'd be happy to answer. The only question I have is on climate change and um, what work uh, the council and others are doing uh, to coordinate with the flood board. So we're, we're working right now on the climate vulnerability assessment um, that um, the, the planning division of the stewardship council is working on and that they have a technical advisory committee and a stakeholder advisory group as well. So that the climate, um, right now they're just doing uh, the assessment, the climate vulnerability assessment uh, for the Delta and, and then the next stage will be an adaptation plan. So on, in both of those, there's an opportunity for, for lots of input and engagement across agencies or, or stakeholders. And I would say we at the state board, particularly with the uh, Bay Delta unit and our shop are deeply engaged in that. And at the stewardship council meeting that John referred to earlier, um, where I was giving the quarterly report, there was also a whole panel on uh, flood control issues and how does it fit into the overall um, uh, vulnerability assessment to climate change. So um, 
again, the Stewardship Council is a place where a lot of different agencies with different missions and different budgets and different staffs can come together on common problems, and that's a, that is a great example of, of that kind of coordination that happens around the Stewardship Council uh, organizing, funding, and staffing a two-year program for vulnerability assessment and adaptation strategy that I think we, as well as the Flood Board and others, can refer to as a scientific basis for actions that we'll be expected to take. Okay. I'll, mo I'll move on to, uh, and we can come back if you have other questions on that. So the other thing I wanted to highlight of, of recent issues is the, um, the draft, the release of the draft um, chapter uh, amendment for the ecosystem chapter of the Delta plan that just came out a week and a half ago. This has been, a, this has been in the works for two years as well, ever since I arrived at the, at the Stewardship Council. And um, this is uh, a major update to um, improve the management and understanding of restoration issues, ecosystem issues within the Delta, and, and set a vision for a restored Delta ecosystem as part of the co-equal goals. So um, this chapter, as I mentioned, just came out uh, on November 21st. Public comments are available until January, or being accepted until January 21st, so there's a long opportunity to provide input on this. The amendment, um, as I mentioned, is really provides recommendations for large-scale restoration at, with a focus on adaptive management. And um, it, I think what's important about the ecosystem amendment, a change, is that it really focuses on ecosystem function. So trying to push away from thinking just about single species management and really focus on ecosystem function. It highlights the importance of land water connections and um, also considering current land uses. So I think um, the other important thing, that term that is used throughout the document is process-based restoration and that also is referred in the paper that I'm gonna highlight, really thinking about how do we do restoration using physical, engaging physical processes as well as biological processes, reconnecting the land water, those make, improving those land water connections. Um, the, the chapter is focused around five core strategies that were, were actually also part of the original um, chapter, but are, are updated and highlighted. So they focus on flow issues and improving functional flows, ecosystem functions, as I already mentioned, thinking about restoration at appropriate elevations given the issues of subsidence within the Delta, emphasizing the importance of promoting native species and considering how we try to reduce impacts of non-natives, and then improving institutional coordination. Um, it sets a target of 60 to 80,000 acres of habitat restoration in the Delta based on uh, existing recovery plans and conservation strategies. In order to promote large-scale restoration, it sets up tiers for restoration based on specific um, characteristics of restoration projects. Those including, there's five, cat, five considerations. If the project restores hydrologic, geomorphic, and biological processes, if it is large scale, if it improves connectivity, if it increases native vegetation cover, and if it contributes to the recovery of special status species. So um, the idea is that any project that is a covered action that comes to the council will have to identify where it falls on each of those categories, and we will be at least then collecting information about what, how many of the projects we're doing are individual isolated restoration projects and how many are really addressing these larger scale issues so that we can begin to evaluate the, the effectiveness of larger scale restoration. So um, that actually also feeds right into this, the paper that I wanted to highlight for you which um, the title is Linkages Between Flow Regime, Biota, and Ecosystem Processes, Implications for River Restoration. This is a very new paper that just came out in Science, the, the highest profile journal, science journal in, in the country. And um, I think it's, it, it's a really valuable review. It, it doesn't, it's not like brown, groundbreaking in that um, it's not new, new discoveries, but it really is a valuable synthesis. And one thing we talk about a lot in the Delta here is the importance of doing synthesis and really 
um, bringing together existing knowledge. So it was done by Margaret Palmer, who is the director of the National Socio-Environmental Synthesis Center in Annapolis, Maryland. It's a, uh, about a five-year-old center established by the National Science Foundation to promote national synthesis across agencies and universities. Um, and then her co-author is Albert Ruhi, who is a relatively new faculty member at UC Berkeley, who is doing really a outstanding work um, on these issues of flow and other factors affecting river restoration. Um, I think as the title um, identifies, the paper really highlights the linkages between flow and it, I, it, it identifies that it's not just one aspect of flow, but they talk about the flow regime and the flow characteristics, how that affects organisms or biota, and how that links to ecosystem processes, things like nutrient dynamics, productivity of ecosystems. And they go through and identify um, all, all the kinds of issues that uh, linkages across those various factors from a wide range of systems across the globe. One of the key things they do is to identify the importance of new technologies, the importance of the you know, high-speed data collection that's being done for flow, for nutrients, for all kinds of other um, data, and that you use do, collecting data in that way and then incorporating new analysis techniques using large data sets, we can get much better insights into variability of flow and how that affects other things. Albert actually also presented just a couple weeks ago at the um, Ecosystem Restoration Symposium that I'll talk about in a second. And he presented there about work that he did um, in Southwest systems, looking at flow variability, effects on native fish versus um, invasive species and using some really sophisticated new techniques. It, from his interpretation, he was able to show that flow was about four times as important as non-native non -native species impact. So I think there's some really new opportunities to take advantage of some of these technologies and analyses that will give us some valuable insights for management and for restoration. They also highlight this really is at a relatively early stage. It's not, there's still lots of uncertainties and unknowns about how we can improve some of these questions. Um, but the, the, the next bullet there also really just highlights what I already mentioned in terms of those connections across flow issues and the importance of flow regimes. The questions they set out to answer were, how does flow variation or flow regime control organisms directly and indirectly? So getting at the kind of question I mentioned with Alberts of, is it, is it flow or is it flow's effect through changing non-native species or flow's effects on pred predators or other um, organisms? Um, and then they also look at um, how it affects those issues like primary productivity and nutrient uptake that I, that I also already mentioned. They, the last part of the paper highlights um, how we can use this insight of, ne of, of current systems to improve our understanding of restoration and how we might implement restoration in a much more effective way, highlighting process-based restoration that is exactly what we've been pushing for in the ecosystem, uh, e ecosystem amendment and also the importance and essential nature of connectivity of habitats across different systems. Some of the highlights they bring up in terms of research challenges and opportunities include understanding not just individual physical drivers, but interactions amongst physical drivers, understanding not just plants and animals, but microbial processes and systems and how that affects nutrient dynamics and productivity and other processes. Uh, understanding wetland connectivity in the upper watershed and how that affects uh, flow further down within the system and incorporating human dimensions and social issues into this research. So that's sort of the big scale picture. Um, and this uh, figure highlights those connections in terms of the different organisms, the factors there that are highlighted in, ter in terms of the arrows are some of the physical factors and flow, droughts, um, variability in flows, how those affect organisms, how those affect productivity, algal path, algal productivity, detrital issues in terms of decomposition and other factors, and, and, and food web dynamics across all of those. So uh, again, highlighting the linkages across those flow, biota, and ecosystem processes. Okay, so then the second article is closer to home and is uh, an article that summarizes work that was done to evaluate the um, ecological effects of the 2015 
um, emergency drought barrier. This was done by Wim Kimmerer and many other colleagues. Um, it was supported by the Stewardship Council. And um, as I think you all know, there was a tempor temporary barrier that was constructed across False River in 2015 to prevent salinity intrusion at the, in, at the end of the drought. And um, this was put in place in May 2015 and, the, and in place until November 2015 to prevent salinity intrusion into Frank's track. So it's just west of Frank's track. So uh, board member McGuire, right where we were out in the field and we saw that exactly where it was in and, and the issues in terms of the flow through Frank's track that it, this was designed to prevent. So it was put in place by DWR and they did lots of monitoring around flow issues but there, was not fun, there weren't funds available from them to do um, evaluate ecological impacts. So the science program provided funds of almost a million dollars, about $900,000 to look at various potential impacts. And there were concerns about spread of invasive clams, uh, harmful algal blooms, spread of invasive weeds, and impacts to delta smell, primarily through impacts to zooplankton and food web impacts. So this multi-member uh, team looked at all, all those issues. What they found was that, um, and what DWR found, DWR found as well, was that the barrier was very effective at reducing salinity intrusion, and, and um, in that regard was, was very, uh, was a positive action. Um, there were some short-term effects on invasive clams, so there were increases in invasive clams over the short term. There were no significant effects on harmful algal blooms or on the zooplankton that, were, um, that might impact delta smelt. But the one sort of moderately surprising effect was the permanent increase in aquatic weeds. And that's really highlighted here in this figure that shows you um, the lighter colored areas are open water areas and the darker areas are areas with dense aquatic weeds. And Frank's track is very shallow. Um, prior to 2014, there, the, there's flow coming in from the west, from the left side there when the tides are coming in that pushes water, high flow water into Frank's track through a, that's referred to as the nozzle. And it's the high, there's high, enough high flow that it doesn't allow much vegetation to get established. With the barrier in place, there was no longer high flows occurring there. And you can see in 2015, it was, easy, it was completely colonized by invasive um, aquatic plants. And um, even though the barrier was removed in the, at the end of 2015, the aquatic vegetation remains. So although the flow is increased, the vegetation reduces the flow, and, um, and the, younger, the newly establishing plants are much more sensitive to flow than, the, than once they're well established. And so that, the challenge there, I think, is so that, that really is the, lar the biggest long-term impact, ecological impact of the barrier and something that was somewhat anticipated, but no one anticipated that it would stick around for that long of a period and definitely has effects on native fish and other um, species. So you're talking about um, hyacinth, hyacinth, whatever, I can't remember how to pronounce it. No, it's not hyacinth, it's okay. um, a pond weed that's rooted, the rooted at the bottom because hyacinth is just floating. So these mm -hmm. are um, rooted plants that are at the, on the bottom, but then grow up through the shallow water. Has there been um, yeah, any, Algeria. any effort of eradication? So there, there are effort, localized efforts at eradication, but not, um, not across the entire um, pond. But now, now I, I think probably many of you are aware of the, the consideration of potential restoration opportunities within Frank's track. And so I think the idea is to try to um, change the bathymetry, increase the depth so that the the rooted plants wouldn't be able to get established and, and go, go about control in that way rather than spraying. Mm -hmm. What's about the square mileage of Frank's track? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm real bad at those sense, kinds of numbers. Sense like so the I don't want to say. Area. Yeah. It's, um, it's a sort of an average size pond. It's, yeah, I'd say four to 6,000 acres. Yeah, that's what I would think, mid, yeah. mid thousands acres. Okay, thank you. Just trying to get a sense of scale. Thank you. Those weeds significantly uh, um, impact water skiing. I can, yeah. I can say that personally. <laughs> Boating activities are severely impacted. <laughs> so it's not just for fish, but for recreational activities, it has a, has a major impact. Fishing or water skiing. Um, okay, so uh, I, think, I, I think, you know, really what that summer, what that report really, or that um, paper really highlights is 
we, we need to prepare for, for droughts always, and, and not only in terms of management, but in terms of science, so that we can learn from them, we can manage them and improve our management um, by, by monitoring, and, and um, I think we will do a better job with the management and the monitoring next time around. So. Okay, so, um, and I just wanna highlight a f uh, two recent conferences, the State of the Estuary Conference that was held in late October in Oakland. This is sort of a companion to the State of the Bay, or the Bay Delta Science Conference. It, it historically was all about the Bay. It's become much more about the Bay and the Delta, and is the San Francisco Estuary Conference, not the San Francisco Bay Conference. Um, one of the things that uh, many of us have been pushing for is really improving that connection, and there was a special session, a plenary session around Bay Delta watershed connections that Felicia Marcus, your former chair, Jim Clern from USGS, and Rachel Johnson from um, NOAA gave a, a really nice series of presentations about the importance of wh why we should consider those connections and, and um, think about not just science, but management across that, the entire estuary, um, rather than just thinking about the Bay or the Delta. So that was one major theme. There was also a big, uh, a highlight, a, a number of sessions on climate change and coastal resilience issues. And um, also uh, a, a, a forward-looking science panel that really was similar to the issues that I mentioned in terms of the DPIC science initiative, but thinking about how do we take that, what we're doing in the belt, in the Delta and apply it across the entire estuary. Michael George participated in that discussion as well, and I think it was a really valuable discussion thinking about how the same kinds of ideas of how do we prepare for longer term challenges across the entire estuary. And then the last issue I think that was really highlighted throughout was social science issues and human dimensions, and there were actually two plenary sessions around um, social science issues uh, there. Also, the State of the Estuary update was released at the um, conference, and if you haven't seen that, I'll, 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 I'll send you a link to the executive summary and the full report that came out. It's an interim report of, for the State of the Estuary. The last, the complete one was done in 2015. The interim one, so it's not as complete in terms of looking at a large number of indicators. There's just five indicators that are looked at. Water flow, beneficial floods, tidal mar acreage of tidal marsh, uh, fish conditions and urban water use. And um, importantly, they're looked at across the Bay and the Delta. And then um, there also are some new indicators that are were, were just sort of uh, identified as um, potential indicators for the next full report. So they weren't evaluated in full, but they were presented as emerging indicators. One being around subsidence and elevation issues that obviously will be very critical for the Delta one around shoreline resilience and how do we measure shoreline resilience across the entire system, and then around urban green space and also around um, use of working lands would be a part of that urban green space evaluation. So not just nat natural lands, but managed um, areas as well. <clears throat> Um, then I'll briefly mention that we also uh, had this Thresholds and Ecosystem Restoration Conference, or symposium, a one-day symposium with UC Davis just a few weeks ago. And um, the idea of this was thinking about that restoration projects don't always develop exactly as planned. They, they hit thresholds and they change unexpectedly. And so trying to understand from an ecological theory perspective, how do we apply that understanding of ecosystem development to restoration projects. And it was really valuable. There were uh, presentations from colleagues from the Florida Everglades, from um, uh, uh, the Northeast and the Chesapeake Bay system. So there was a wide range of perspectives, all highlighting sort of this, un the value of understanding these physical forces or factors that cause changes in ecosystem development. How do we incorporate that into managing a system and um, restoring systems. Where, where should we try to change things? If, if things are off course, where, should we, where are there opportunities to change them? Where should we just accept that it's something that's out of our control and, and it's not really worth um, the effort that we can put, it, that we could put effort into other, af, other areas and have much better, larger scale benefits. So that, that was just a, a valuable recent conference. And then a few things upcoming. I've mentioned the social science task force to you previously, so their draft report is coming out in the next few weeks, and it will be available for public comment and um, for a, a month or two, and then they'll put out a final report um, later 
in, in early 2020. So I'll, I'll be sure to make you aware of that because I think it will be a very valuable report that I think there's growing interest in how we do, how we engage social scientists in the Delta and use that kind of information in our decision making. So I think their report will be very, very valuable. The Delta Science Fellowship Program that we support is still open and, and applications are available to, through December 20th. So that's an important um, program that we support to train new young scientists. And then we have another upcoming symposium on environmental DNA at the end of January. And then lastly, my term is ending as lead scientist, not immediately, but in, in about nine months. At, I'll be going back to University of San Francisco where, I, where I'm a regular faculty member to teach in fall of 2020. And so given that it takes a long time to do these kinds of searches, it's already underway. The search for my uh, replacement, um, and I can tell you there's some very good candidates. I'm not involved directly in the search, but I think there probably candidates will be coming for interviews sometime in early 2020. And I probably wouldn't be even uh, a viable candidate given with, the, with those candidate, the candidates that we currently have. So we have some really good people for the lead scientist position. And then we also have large turnover on the independent science board. Um, because the science board was created about 10, just a little, nine years ago. So in August 2020, five of the 10 original members have served 10 full years, which is a, an indication of how much their, their commitment and their interest in serving. Um, but they're limited, they have a 10 year term limit. So we, ha we are recruiting now um, five or six new members for the independent science board. We have 40 applicants for that, and I, I am coordinating that um, search, and I think also we have some really outstanding people. Um, that will be a, a similar time frame. We'll probably be um, trying to appoint them early in 2020 so that they will be on board to start in um, fall, early fall 2020. So with that, I'm happy to answer questions. I didn't have any pictures of uh, otters. I'll have to <laughs> do better next time, but... Um, Happy to answer questions. The Delta is just as charismatic a place. Yes. There's plenty the of grits are, great grits are fauna and flora to be able to see. No, I really appreciate the update um, and the nod uh, to the social sciences uh, as well um, as an English major, a fellow, fellow member of the humanities here. Um, it is really in, uh, critically important that we, we really start to incorporate that aspect um, as we, you know, sometimes leave out the people component and think this is simply a technical exercise or yeah. scientific exercise amongst us. And I think any, anyone who spent any time in the Delta knows it's a, it's a, it is a people exercise at its heart. So yeah, really I really appreciate completely. that acknowledgement. I was uh, just uh, at the beginning of November, I was at a national meeting, the Coastal and Estuarine Research Federation meeting that was about 1,500 people from across the country. The, the, the best. Uh, science management conference on coastal issues mm -hmm. in the country. And um, the, the lead presentation was on social science. So I think we're not alone here in thinking about that. And they had some really good people st with very similar insights and very similar challenges that we're dealing with here. That's really great to hear. And when it comes to the search now for not just your replacement, but it sounds like a significant portion of the independent science uh, uh, board is gonna be, you know, we're, we're uh, you know, looking to attract the best and brightest minds, certainly to the Delta and our challenges here. So looking forward to seeing how we can help continue to put out there that, you know, and it sounds like we have a number of good applicants already. Yeah, so. we do. And for the, the, the Independent Science Board is not a public search, um, but the lead scientist position, they'll give, w when the candidates are announced, they'll give public presentations. And there's an opportunity for staff to, they'll, in addition to their public presentation, there'll be opportunities for staff to come and meet the candidate and, and weigh in. Right. Um, so I think, I, I'm sure your staff will have an opportunity. Yeah, some of the board. Yeah, we're looking for a interested. real significant upgrade yeah. in yeah. lead <laughs> scientists. <laughs> Don't you have that opportunity? <laughs> Well, actually, uh, uh, Mr. George and I were, were discussing, one, your incredible contributions and really thankful for it. But I was like, well, so quick. But yes, uh, limited to a two-year term, and rightfully so, I think. Yeah, three uh, years. Three, three years, okay, but it goes years. fast. Okay. Yeah, they <laughs> it go, does go it, fast. They, I can't believe it. Well, Sorry. and, and, um, and it, 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 uh, it better uh, reflects the need of than those people that we bring into the positions like yourself who are faculty and looking to get back to, to your your actual jobs in it. I think that um, I just want to thank you first and foremost. Okay. We'll still see you, I'm yeah, sure, yeah. in a couple I, I updates here. I, I, yeah. So, I'll be back but nonetheless, uh, I hope we'll also 
I hope we'll also have some opportunity for overlap. I think the overlap between Cliff Dom and John was, was extraordinary. Very valuable. valuable. For me, for me, it was incredibly valuable. So I think we're, we're trying to arrange that so that um, whoever comes on would overlap for a month or so. Any other thoughts or questions from fellow board members? No. Thank you again. Just really sure. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. That we will then move on to uh, num item number nine, our board member reports. I'll start with mine, which was just really one item to mention was uh, last Monday, I participated in the, a binational conference that was put on by uh, San Diego State uh, University, SDSU, down in San Diego region, uh, focusing, it was a uh, first day was on the San Diego side, second day uh, was in uh, Tijuana, but it was focusing on the Tijuana River Valley, Valley the shared valley there in the region, and uh, all the efforts and you know, discussions around how to fix the immediate issues, uh, certainly when it comes to the sewage overflows, historic issues that we know the community has seen in previous decades when mar uh, you know, capital and, and interest is marshaled and you see a fix happen on, on uh, the Mexican side of the border and it was also part of the fix on the US side when it comes to the facility there, but then here we are again. Uh, where it's a, again a crisis and again a moment. I think a lot of the themes of, of um, the, the uh, event and the conference were, were really appropriate. It was reborder, it was reimagining, it was about how, how do the communities reimagine the, their infrastructure and also themselves. And I think that that's a common theme that we've found um, with our work on drinking water throughout the state. Uh, as we go into communities, it is not just about the infrastructure need, the need to, in this case, on the Tijuana River Valley, stop these uh, uh, wastewater uh, sewage overflows. But uh, on the drinking water side, you know, obviously providing clean, safe, affordable drinking water. But what you encounter are uh, the context of, you know, the, the history and the communities there. And that also has to be overcome. So it's about, it is about the communities themselves being able to imagine them, what they want to look like in the decades ahead. And so it was a very powerful conference, I will say. I, they said I was supposed to give the keynote. The keynote went to a uh, fourth grader um, uh, who uh, presented in a very uh, passionate, clear, far more concise way than I'm ever able to deliver the need to address the, the, the sewage issues in the Juana River Valley and the lack of access it creates for the communities there who then aren't able to go to the beach, go enjoy these, these, these places and what that does to families and kids. And so it was, it was a great uh, conference and I was glad to be able to participate. Uh, and that was really, other than uh, spending uh, a, a few days, a good few days in the Coachella Valley last week with family, that was all I really have to report. Actually not quite a report, but a request or a question to staff I received an email on something that I'm not familiar with, and I'm hoping that you could look into it. There is apparently something being developed in Sacramento called the Sacramento Regional Coalition to End Homelessness. And one of their first uh, focus is on providing sanitation. So I don't know to what extent our staff has heard but engaged in it. I'm trying to find out more information myself but uh, perhaps we can both look into it and then put our heads together and see if there is a, a role for us. I will. All right, my, my one item, um, other than being able to spend some time with family last week as well, is um, the prior week on the 20th, I was able to go down to Burbank for the IRWM Roundtable of Regions uh, meeting, which they haven't had for a few years. And I thought, um, so, you know, I, th I would say they were, they were overdue. Um, you know, IRWM is a storied program. It's had its ups and downs, but certainly um, it was a good discussion that we had. And I think there was, you know, they've given great pause to the IRWM program fundamentally and are very open to understanding what it would take to reinvigorate the program in order to help incentivize the type of regional collaboration that I think and believe that it really has um, fostered in a number of regions around the state. So it was, I th you know, 
the group had a had a nice brainstorming session. There was all kinds of stickers on the walls with ideas of things that they can improve about the programs and just brainstorming ideas. Um, so I'm I'm encouraged to hear that, and I think they're putting some comments together, and you know we'll see what they come up with. But you know certainly, you know a lot has been invested in that program over the years, and um, I'm I'm excited to see what you know what the future could have in store because I do think, you know watershed based multi-benefit management of projects, you know, truly is the way to go. And so to the extent that IRWM can be and should be a piece of that, um, yeah, we'll, we'll just have to see, but it's good. Great, I'm, re I'm actually really glad to hear we were able to uh, attend board member. Um, yeah, we, as we heard earlier with certainly our discussion around the state revolving fund, you know, there are, there are numerous sort of pots throughout the state, a number, I wouldn't say that numerous, but enough that being mindful of the programs, trying to better evaluate and understand how their effectiveness has been or hasn't, and you know, it is something that I think we here at the board certainly try to strive toward. You know, with a public board, it, we provide that there is that sort of churn around interest that, you know, as a board member might get an email and direct it then to the executive director. We're able to, I don't know, sometimes self-evaluate. Uh, I think uh, on a more regular basis, but we can always do better. And I think that that's what the important sort of goal of, of any of those discussions is, how do we start to just continue to see better implementation of projects in the watersheds that we know are out there and that we need to, to, to try to see funded. And Integrated Regional Water Management Program is an important program that's been out there. As you said, it has its storied history. It has sort of its own evolution, just like our programs. And so I really appreciate that cross-pollination, if you will, between the state board, DWR, you know, it, all, it is all a pretty limited set of um, pots and agencies that we are. So thank you for that. With that, I think we have a, an item on uh, board member priorities and discussion uh, and organizational issues that we'll have a discussion on. We'll retreat to room 230 to just finish that item quickly, unless, you know, you wanted to conduct the item from I don't think there's I, too much. I know it was a yeah, quick I, update just, that I just you wanted to give to you provide. a short um, update. I don't think we need to move to the other room. It'd just be a couple minutes. Um, <clears throat> we haven't gotten to you guys a revised um, um, document. Um, won't go into the details, but we have we have like a totally marked up, complicated um, um, document. So we're still working on it. Um, um, James Knockbauer from ORPP has been our scribe. He was out last week. Um, and I just wanted to let you know that we're doing our best to include, include your individual edits, um, um, including things like within some of our buckets, prioritizing the items that are listed and some of the editing and language and trying to, trying to um, get the contributions from various divisions and offices kind of to the same level. Um, <clears throat> I will say that um, kind of as expected in this kind of exercise, um, the list has really grown, um, and just for example, um, you know, we even though we've listed this thematically and not by um, by officer division, which which I personally really like because it kind of helps helps us see the board work as a board in a more integrated way. But let's face it, at some point we do have to back parts of these out and kind of see what the workload is for specific um, offices. So for DWQ, for example. There are 26 priorities, and that's not really, um, I mean, that's not really priority setting. I mean, we, as we know, um, the board does, the board staff does a lot more work that's in a priority document. We do have our core, core workloads, um, and um, we can leave all these in um, if we want. But I think it's really important from a staff perspective to get a better sense of what the collective board priorities are for you know, the top you know, 10 items or for every office. So <clears throat> what I propose to do, and I, I can't remember who, but one of you in our last session sort of um, suggested some sort of survey. And I think that what we'd like to do, um, I already asked DWQ, and I'm gonna ask the other major divisions and parts, not every single office, because I don't wanna overwhelm them or you, to put together, to pull to pull out of this structure um, um, by division, for instance, for by division of drinking water, DFA, the big ones, DWQ, water rights, um, all of the actions that, are, were the, that they're the lead on, <clears throat> and ask the division to have, give you the staff priorities, and then ask each of you to identify uh, 
based on the number, I'll try to figure out a reasonable number, and we'll kind of use that as a kind of a loose indication about whether there's agreement or, or not, because there were a lot of suggestions that were great that individual board members made that it's, we don't really have a sense of whether um, it was a sense of the board or if it's a um, priority of an individual board member. And, and again, we are really open to working on almost all of these as resources permit, but in terms of wanting to get guidance from you all about, you know, if time or resources are scarce, if we aren't, you know, what is it that you really want us to make progress on, get over the finish line, whatever the, you know, wherever we are in a particular project. And if we have to make choices, what are we going to, you know, where, what are we going to put resources to and what are we on? What, what are we not? So um, I'm going to send those lists out to the divisions today with a short turnaround asking for their prioritizations, just so you know, just another relevant, um, you know, set of information. Um, and then <clears throat> um, if you guys don't mind a relatively quick turnaround, because we would like to then um, incorporate that information in a newer, cleaner version um, and get that to you before the next board meeting so you have a chance to look at it. And so timing-wise, that would mean if we get you something, um, not today, but hopefully tomorrow or Thursday, if it would be possible for you to get it back to us by by Tuesday so that we can turn around and get you a, a, a draft. Um, that would be that would be my ask. I just wanted to let you know what we're what we're thinking about. Um, trying not to make it too complicated, um, but to again get a bit a little bit more of your collective thoughts about priorities. No, I just have a silly question. Are all those DWQ priorities in one unit, like the oceans unit? <laughs> No. <laughs> okay, so the only thing that I would um, add, and I think that's a good plan, is just to highlight where there is a legislative or um, a court mandate um, uh, that, you know, additional information for us to better understand on uh, the rankings. And then um, the other question that I had is if DWQ has 26, how many of those did we add? <laughs> Did it st I'm trying to get a better sense of what what I, we've added. I actually think that workload. list was theirs. <coughs> okay. Before. And All so right. um, that was, you know, that was that was on them, but that was to give you guys a menu. Um, and again, I'm not saying that we won't make progress on any of these or that we can't work with individual board members on things that you're interested in. Um, I will also say there were a number of suggestions that we're going to keep track of about that individual board members asked about that they would like more information or they want to work with us. And sometimes there were some suggestions about kind of categories of inquiry um, that really haven't um, been, uh, there hasn't been a lot of discussion, there hasn't been a, the time to have a lot of discussion about how would, what would that mean in terms of an actual project and what would the, the resources be required there, you know, I mean, it, it's easy to throw out a suggestion of, oh, I don't know, we were thinking about last year it was, or a year or two ago, it was a priority to develop an internship program. Um, I don't actually think it met it on the priority list, but it's actually taken a lot of time and energy to kind of coordinate that, build the program, you know, work it out, all that kind of stuff. And so um, I think we're going to have a running list um, <clears throat> just based on our, our views that it's not, we haven't, based on suggestions that you all have made um, in our conversations, that they warrant more discussion, but at this point, we don't have enough of a sense of exactly what kind of project board members were talking about and what the sort of staff investment would be. And so we'd like to c continue to talk to you guys about that. And, um, you know, obviously, if you want to pull it out and put it back into the priorities, that's fine. Or we can, you know, at the midterm report and adjustment phase, we could put it back in. I think that sounds good. Uh, don't have much to add. I appreciate, you know, I know it's not an easy task to try to synthesize what are uh, five individual board member priority documents and say, okay, how does that translate into sort of a state board priority document, but really appreciate it. You know, this was a topic of conversation um, in the recent chair's call, just around the priority setting that the regional boards kind of go through and how is it that we can continue to kind of have a better situational awareness of 
things that different regions are, are going to be focusing on throughout the year, what we, what we will be focusing on, how that all feeds up, and how do we all you know, continue to better have a, just a, a greater sense of um, the, the work that we'll be trying to complete in a given year and the priorities or things that we're looking to try to emphasize, knowing that uh, the priorities document or the, the sort of work plan isn't going to incorporate everything that goes on in a daily basis, all 2,000 of our staff in the agency, but how do we kind of continue to comb that? So just really appreciate staff's work around all that. So thank you. And well, with that then, I will close the meeting. We're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. See you in a couple weeks.